So I want to start with common positions and assumptions, and then their presumed basis, and then talk about the problems. So that's the pattern we'll use. And eventually, the slide presentation after this, I'm going to try to give you some points of clarity that I think you know, we, we can be pretty certain about, and then add a few uh, divine counsel tidbits, divine counsel bacon bits, I guess, over the top of this, <laughs> that uh, we'll look at certain eschatological topics in light of some of the divine counsel stuff in the Old Testament. And we may, you know, I may speculate a little bit here and there for you, but i probably keep this to a minimum, may not do it at all. Positions and assumptions. There's going to be a future thousand-year kingdom. National Israel has a prophetic future. The Jerusalem temple will be rebuilt. There will be a rapture. Okay, all of those things are positions people take, and they are based on certain assumptions. Now, whether you realize it or not, these things are based on your interpretation of the promises given to Abraham, the promises given to David. Seventy weeks of Daniel, again, how you presume that should be interpreted. And the flow of the book of Revelation. And whatever you mean by imminence. You know, we believe the Bible teaches imminence. Jesus could come back right now. What is imminence anyway? Prophetic literalism. What is literalism? And your assumption that second coming passages, when they don't all have the same wording, they must be different events. That's an assumption. There's nothing like a there's like no footnote in the original, you know, Hebrew and Greek that says, you know, footnote. When passages disagree in wording, keep them separate. There's nothing like that. You just guess that's what you're supposed to do. Now, when it comes to these things, especially the promises to Abraham, and to some extent promises to David, there the presumption is usually, this is an unconditional covenant. It doesn't matter what national Israel did or does. God will give them the land. So even though they sinned and went into exile, they, and God brought them back, but they were still beat up by every, you know, two-bit and, you know, legitimate uh, empire that came along. Even though they were scattered, and, you know, they didn't have a nation until 1948. What happened in 1948 must be a fulfillment of this because... The covenant is unconditional. But those are all assumptions. The other side will say, either they send it away, and the church inherited the promises, because Israel failed, or they did get it. Remember the map yesterday about the kingdom of David, and the kingdom of Solomon? They did inherit it, so why are you looking for anything else? You know, what, What's this national future of Israel thing going on? Again, that's where the arguments are going to be. So you can defend either view. Let's look at the Abrahamic promises. Conditional or unconditional? Unilateral or bilateral? Are they dependent on obedience or not? Here is the first one we get, Genesis 12. Okay. Go from your country, I'll show you a land, I'll make of you a great nation, bless you, make your name great, so that you'll be a blessing. And so we have this multiplication of the population, we have a land in here. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you I will curse, so that you, through you, all families of the earth will be blessed. Right here you read this. I don't see any conditions there. It looks unconditional. Genesis 15, 5 through 18. Again, look toward the heaven, number the stars if you're able to number them. So shall your offspring be. To your offspring I will give this land, you know, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. We looked at that yesterday. And then there's this covenant ceremony where 
Abraham falls into a deep sleep and the animals that he took and he split in half and he laid them side by side and then the, the presence of God passes through. You know, again, looks pretty one-sided, looks pretty unilateral or unconditional. And it does. But then you get to Genesis 17. Same guy, Abram, same God, Yahweh. <laughs> You know, same conversation continues. I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. Well, now it sounds like I'm obligated in some way. Be blameless so that I may make my covenant between you, me and you and multiply you greatly. Yeah, this, this is the wording of the previous covenant. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan. That's clearly conditional language. Clearly. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout your generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep. I mean, how many times does he have to say it? Every male among you shall be circumcised. Now, this is pre-Sinai. So the, the fundamental obligation here is, is circumcision, which was the sign of of uh, your entry into the covenant, your agreement to be part of this arrangement. Because when we get to Sinai, there's going to be a whole lot of other things that are connected to possession of the land. And then it most fundamentally, along with circumcision, will be love the Lord thy God, him only shall you worship, that sort of thing. And then, then the focus becomes loyalty to Yahweh as the lone object of worship. Okay, do not go into idolatry. Genesis 22, again, this is the uh, Abraham and Isaac you know, offering thing. We get down to the end here. In your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Now, for those of you out there in internet land, and of course for those of you here, <clears throat> here's the point. When God tells Abraham to offer Isaac to you know, test his loyalty, his faith, Abraham could not just say, you know, I don't feel like doing that. That's just kind of scary. Uh, I think I'll skip that. Because I know I'll still get the land. I'll still have a great family. I'll still have a great name, I'll still be a blessing because God unilaterally promised that to me with no obligations. Okay? No. That's specifically denied here. Okay? And in the rest of the story. Deuteronomy 4, we've actually looked at these verses before, but I threw them back in here. <clears throat> Again, this is idolatry right here. If you act corruptly by making a carved image in the form of anything, just backtrack a little bit. You've got to understand what Deuteronomy is. Almost the entire book is three or four sermons of Moses when they're back you know, on the cusp of going back into the land. That's why it's called, it's called Deuteronomy because you know, they run around for 40 years, they get back to where they started from, and Moses says, Okay, there's a new generation around here now. Most of the old generation has died off because of the sin back, you know, in Numbers 13. So let's go over the law. Let's rehearse that, shall we? And he goes through these long sermons, and he, he re-gives the law. Okay? There are changes between Deuteronomy and Exodus because they reflect a different time and different circumstances going into the land as opposed to just being a wandering people. So there's stuff like that. But it's the law. And in this book, this is where you get clear, you know, repeatedly, connections between being loyal to God and being in the land. Because if you're disloyal, the Lord will scatter you among all the peoples, and you'll be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you out. I'll kick you out of the land if you're not loyal to me. 
It's just over and over and over and over again in, in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 5, Be careful to do, therefore, as the Lord your God has commanded, that you may live long in the land that you shall possess. If we're going to go in, if you want to stay there, <laughs> you better be loyal to me. Go ahead. How did, um, in the book of Hebrews, it says that, uh, the writer says that Abraham knew that even if he went through with the sacrifice, that God could raise his son from the dead. How does the writer to Hebrews know that that's the way Abraham was that well, kind of faith or that kind of thinking? I think it. I think that's based on subtle language in the Abraham and Isaac story, where Abraham takes Isaac, you know, and they they have the, the wood there with them, and he says to his servant. Uh, I and the child will go to worship, and we shall return. You know, just things like that. He, he, Abraham knows he's going to go offer Isaac, because he's going to obey God. He doesn't understand it, doesn't like it. He's going to obey God. But he, he says there, we'll both be coming back. So, it's a little hint that, again... It's not that Abraham exactly knew how this would happen, but he believed that God could actually do that. And so he was going to go through with it. And I think that's what the, the writer of Hebrews picks up on. Yes? Now, Abraham comes out of a pagan background. At that time period, there was child sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Did he think somehow that, well, maybe this, this new deity has chosen me, I've embraced mm -hmm. him, that somehow he's similar to these other ones in this regard? I'm, I'm extraordinarily skeptical of that because you're not going to find child sacrifice in Babylon. You're also, and I say Babylon because most people think that Ur of the Chaldees, where Abraham comes from, is in Babylonia. I don't. But there's, a, there's another Ur, Ura, in uh, Syria, near Haran, which is where Abraham's relatives are. Well, who'd have thought that? Um, but they didn't practice it in, you know, in Syria either. I mean, child sacrifice, you know, we think that this was ubiquitous, you know, all over the ancient world. It, I don't want to say it was uncommon, but, it's, but everybody didn't do it. There were, you know, pop people groups that, that did this regularly, but that doesn't mean everyone did it. And to my knowledge, I don't know of any evidence that that uh, it would have been practiced by uh, Abraham's Semitic relatives, or certainly if, if, if you take a Babylonian location there. Um, so I, I don't think there's any connection there at all. But. Deuteronomy 6, again, this is the greatest commandment. Okay, to love the Lord thy God. Again, in verses 4 and 5, when we get to down here to verses 16 and so, it's the same thing. Obey to avoid being pushed out of the land. The whole commandment I command you today, you shall be careful to do that you may live and multiply. Go to, I mean, you've got to look at these terms. These are right out of the covenant. Okay, this is not, again, accidental language. Exodus 23, again, we have the borders of the land. We saw this yesterday. Um, Lay up these words of mine, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers. If you're careful to do this, everything will be great. Again, you get the borders of the land down here. Leviticus 26 we saw yesterday. Keep my Sabbath, reverence my sanctuary. Again, all these things, don't make idols, they're about the exclusive worship of Yahweh. That's the big issue. Over and over and over again. And that's linked to dwelling securely in the land and God's presence in the land among them. In Leviticus 26, If in spite of all this you will not listen to me, but walk contrary to me, then I will walk contrary to you in fury, and myself I will discipline you sevenfold for your sins. We'll actually come back to that verse. Uh, let's just skip through. And you saw this graphic yesterday, again, about whether the land is fulfilled or not. So, Let's go stay here. The issue is, again, based upon a certain assumptions of how the covenants work, how this covenant works, we'll get to the other one in a moment, based upon certain assumptions, people will 
conclude certain things about a national future for Israel and, of course, a millennial kingdom. Now, you say, well, you know, they went in, into exile and they were brought back. Yes, they were. God finally gets to the point when they're on the verge of exile that he, he says to Jeremiah, I want you to go tell the people about a new covenant. I'm going to make a new covenant with you. Remember Jeremiah 31. And in that covenant, God basically says, this is the, the, the Heiser paraphrase version, you people are perpetual screw-ups. And so what I'm going to do, <laughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to change your heart. I'm going to send my spirit. I'm going to change your heart. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that there will always be somebody out there who believes. There will always be a remnant. Because I'm going to win. I'm going to get this done. I will live on earth with men, you know, with my family. I'm going to do all these things. Of course, that you know goes into play again at Pentecost, okay, the whole indwelling of the Spirit, where, where now we are the temples and all this kind of sort of thing. Um, it shows that the covenants are conditional, and when people are disloyal and disobey in sin, God hates that. You know, he, he, he doesn't want that to be the case, but you are free to choose to be disloyal, but I just want you to know, I will have a people. And I, if I need to step in, and again, always make sure there's a remnant, I'm going to do it. Okay, I will not surrender what is mine. You know, even again, allowing you to be free. I will not surrender what is mine. Go ahead. So by making the new covenant there in Jeremiah 31, he's saying there's a defect in the old covenant. He's saying there's a defect in people. Okay. Okay. If we want to say there's a, you, know, you could say, well, there's, there's a defect in this whole idea, God. What are you doing trusting humanity? God would say, yeah, you're right. They're perpetual screw-ups, but I love them. Isn't that something to do like with the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament? It came and went, Pompey? Now there, we there, the there is, I will say that this way, because that is really a difficult subject. Uh, because if we really, I'll give you an example. It's very clear in the Old Testament that the Spirit comes and goes. Okay, that language is all over the place. The Spirit comes upon people and arrests people to do a specific task, whether it's build the tabernacle furniture or be king or be a prophet or whatever. And the Spirit moves from person to person. Again, it's an enablement ministry. So people have concluded They've concluded from that that there was no permanency at all in the Spirit's interaction with people in the Old Testament. I don't really think that's the case, because if it's true that no one can be righteous without the assistance of the Spirit, and Paul's kind of clear on that, if that's true, then the righteous people in the Old Testament needed the Spirit too. Now, having said that, there is a difference between what the Spirit does and why in the new that was not an issue in the old. Okay, so there is, there, there is something new about the new covenant. Uh, but to get into that, I, I will lose another hour. <laughs> uh, but I, I, want, I, I say it that way, again, to telegraph to people listening. Yes, there's something new going on here. And it does have to do with creating this circumcision neutral thing we call the church, again, which Paul calls the mystery. It does have to do with uh, making sure there's always a remnant and you know, things like this. But I don't want to divorce that from the need, even in the Old Testament, for people to have the assistance of the Spirit to walk with God. That's all I'm trying to say. Now you look at the borders here, you say, well, I know my view Okay, I don't really care about all those conditions. Thanks for showing those to me now. You know, that's not going to rattle my cage. Oh, great, whatever. <laughs> um, the, if you're honest, you've got to deal with it. You've got to deal with it. And you can fall back to the remnant idea. That's okay. That's in, that's in the Bible too, Jeremiah 31. 
And you can link the remnant idea to the borders of the land. Wonderful. For those of, of uh, among, among us that would say, you know, this is the, more the, the reform crowd and the amillennial crowd, that's it, Mike, give it to them. We're the ones that always believed in the conditionality of the covenants and that it was handed to the church and the church inherits everything. Yeah, I'm loving this. Well, I'll give you something to hate now. <laughs> See this little strip right here? The stuff that wasn't under David and Solomon's control. Depending on which boundary list you use for the land, Israel didn't get the land. Now this is a little map. You'd have to, again, you can, you can look at it when you get the slides. You go down here and it'll tell you what the different set of lines are. There are basically three sets of border parameters for the land in the Old Testament. So the question is, which one matters? Which one should I attach to the covenants? And one, one set will say, well, the ones that, that are actually in Genesis and Exodus, because that's when the covenants were given. Great. These are the ones that mattered when they actually took it. And if you're going by these, they didn't get the land. They never got it. All of it. They got most of it, but they never got all of it. And you can even make an argument based on judges and you know parts of Joshua and, and, and the end of you know, the beginning of Judges, that even what you, what it looks like was taken, sort of kind of wasn't because there's still Canaanites living in their midst. Okay, so like, what's your definition of conquest? What's your definition of take the land? Because if you're the amillennialist and you're going to argue this, you know you, you got to answer those questions. You have to come up with a coherent. Answer, it's probably easier to argue that they didn't get the land, they just send it away. You know, God just punished them and, and gave it to the church. That's probably your easier argument. Of course, then you have to deal with all those passages that we just went through, and I don't think I repeat them here. Oh, yeah, I, I, do, I do this one, Leviticus 26. All of those passages that I showed you, though, as clear as they are about the conditionality, they all have something like this. If they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers, then I'm going to remember my covenant. Now, you, you know, okay, they send it away. But God said, I remember, I'll remember my covenant. He did bring them back to the land. And yeah, they weren't independent until 1948. We understand that. Uh, but if I'm speaking to a millennialist, you don't want to hear anything about 1948 anyway. So... You know, does 1948 matter in terms of the Bible, in terms of biblical prophecy? And you get people really divided, you know, on this issue. And it, and it works its way into, into our current, into current political positions. How friendly do we need to be to Israel and all that kind of stuff? So the real issue, though, behind all those issues, the real issue is, what does it mean that God remembers his covenant with respect to Israel? Does that mean that God, the remembrance happened in 1948. That was the clue. That was the evidence that God remembered his covenant. And of course, then you're going to link that to a future for national Israel and, and we need to be you know, good to Israel and, or we'll be cursed and all this stuff. Or does the remembrance mean the church? Or both. I mean, you actually have three choices there. Which one's right? I don't know. Okay, I, I, I'm just telling you that your, your position, your prophetic positions are not self-evident. You don't just open a Bible and out pops your position on eschatology. Don't tell me the Bible says so. The Bible says all this, too. Okay, the Bible doesn't come with a set of instructions. It doesn't come with a hermeneutical guide. Okay? This is your hermeneutical guide. And you say, well, Mike, it's not just my brain. It's the spirit. Well, that's wonderful. You know, that, that, that's just great, because what that means is that you're the godly one. You're the one led by the spirit, and those other people aren't. Okay? That's part of the reason why the church is in so much trouble. <laughs> okay? Because, you know, we, we, we attach godliness and spirit-ledness, and that's, isn't that a butchery of the English language? <laughs> spirit-ledness to our position on eschatology. 
you know, that somehow the Spirit cleared up the ambiguity for me. I must be special. I must be walking with God. I don't know what's wrong with these other people. They're so dense the Spirit can't reach them. You know, or else they'd, they'd believe in a preacher of rapture. You know, come on. You know, you, you, you just need to get real. You need to, to, I would say, you need to understand that prophecy is deliberately cryptic. Okay, there's a reason for that. And you need to just let God know what's going to go on. Let God knows, know, you know, what the right interpretation is. Sure, take a position, enjoy it, think about it, but be charitable to other positions. Okay, don't don't assign a special level of spirituality to you because you you you, you hold a certain position. That's just ridiculous. <coughs> that is as arrogant as the scholar. Okay, who assigns complete validity to a position because he or she holds it. Okay, it's just as arrogant. Go ahead. In Acts, when um, the uh, I think it's the angel comes to Cornelius and says, "Your gifts and your offerings, have, your prayers have come up uh, before God as a memorial." Mm -hmm. Do you have any sense as to how that happens? Like, how does God, you know, consider our prayers, our gifts, and then, oh, uh, I think I'll do something for this righteous person. Well, I, I, I think the, the imagery is for us. I mean, God doesn't need, God doesn't need uh, visible images. He doesn't need things like that to see and hear. So I'm not quite sure what you're asking. I'm not either, but... Uh... <laughs> uh, you know, you know, ultimately God knows and sees and hears, you know, the heart. Uh, so these, these prayers being offered, um, if, if, if that's the point. In the Old Testament, they would use, um, they would use incense as, a, as imagery, as a symbolic, visible thing uh, for the people to remind the people that down here on earth we're trying to reach, you know, God. You know, in, in the way God wants us to do that. So they were visible reminders like that. They also used incense because when you slaughter lots of animals, it stinks. Uh, so there was a practical use of incense as well. Um, but I think those, those sorts of things are incidental to God and more important you know, for us. That, that's why he, he gives them. Let me muddy the waters even more. <laughs> okay, remember Leviticus 26? Okay, if they confess, I'll remember my covenant. Okay. I will make my dwelling among them. My soul shall not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God. You shall be my people. And of course, that was conditioned on loyalty to Yahweh. And then, but I will, for their sake, remember the covenant with their forefathers. That's actually quoted in the Old Testament, or in the New Testament. What accord has Christ with Belial? What portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Okay. In other words, God dwelling among his people, that happens in us. And we are corporately known as the church, the body of Christ. And he quotes, as soon as, soon as Paul says this, he quotes this stuff over here. I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Okay. So now we're going after the dispensational crowd. If, if you want, again, to, to talk about the, 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 the temple out there, the temple needs to be reviewed. We need a temple, 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 temple. And look, you know, a temple in the land. God's going to dwell in the land. He's going to remember the covenant. Right there. Yeah, you got to deal with that. Paul knew that passage too. <laughs> and he quoted it in conjunction with the church. So, like, what are we going to do with that? Okay, then I remember my covenant again more. Luke 1. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. It's obviously Jesus. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, 
to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. The oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear. So this remembering the covenant idea is connected to Jesus, okay, who is raised up. Now, does that refer to the resurrection, or just does it refer to the, the fact that Jesus came? It's incidental, because this is the first coming that Luke's writing about, not the second. Again, you've got to deal with that. I'm just going through things you have to deal with, no matter what your view is. Promises to David. Is Jesus reigning or not? Here is the Davidic covenant. God comes to, you know, God tells David, again, through the prophet, When your days are fulfilled, you lie down with your fathers. I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, build a house for my name, establish the throne of his kingdom forever. You know, the obvious immediate reference there is Solomon. Uh, but the language, you know, can you know, is malleable as far as a dynasty, a succession. I shall be to him a father, he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him, so on and so forth. But my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. This is the covenant that establishes the legitimacy of only the, the line of David to be king. Only someone from the line of David. Acts 2.30 references this covenant. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with him, or with an oath to him, that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, so on and so forth. Do you see what he's doing here? He's connecting the resurrection of Christ with the Davidic covenant. Now here's the question. Again, if you're a dispensationalist, it's like, you know, the Lord has to the Lord has to come back, and everybody agrees on that point. Thankfully, there's something everybody agrees on. But when he comes back, he sets up a one thousand year kingdom because we need that because of the Davidic covenant. You know, we have to have a, a, a king. We have to have a kingdom on earth, and the, the king is Jesus. And we're going to see this happen, you know, right on earth and before our eyes. Well, again, we might, we might. But the other side would refer to this and say, well, the kingdom is now, and that's all there is. The, the king, this kingdom is the kingdom, and they'll reference verses like this. Now, I have, I have different reasons other than the, the Millennium Passage in, in Revelation 20 uh, for, for thinking that there, I will put it this way, there will be earthly rule on earth, <laughs> hence it's earthly. Uh, but my reasons are different. My reasons are about reclaiming the nations and doing stuff like that. You know, but, um, so, and I, and I'm, I'm in the both and camp, as I said yesterday. Kingdom now, consummation later. And I don't like the term millennium because I think it's too small. Right? I, 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 I can tell you this. My view of the eternal state is the kingdom on earth. Okay? I, think they're, I think they're one and the same. I think when, when, when the Lord returns and there's kingdom rule set on earth, that is never ending because it's a new heaven and a new earth. We don't need a thousand years. A thousand years would be a jip. Okay? Like, what do you mean? A thousand years? Is that all we get? You know, of course, the dispensationalists will say, no, then Satan's released, and there's this big battle, and then there's the eternal state. Well, that depends. Listen, that depends if you read Revelation linearly, chronologically. If you don't, that, that isn't what it looks like at all. We'll get to that in a moment, or sometime today. Luke 2. We do, have a, question. On, we do have a question yes, here. Go ahead. On the slide, two slides prior to that, when he's, is there any, any ambiguity in the commits iniquity that, like in the translation, that it could be that iniquity is placed on Jesus and that could be Jesus? Two which, which, which two, verse? Two slides back. Um, 
where it says then he'll... Oh, here, right here? Yeah. When, is there any translational kind of ambiguity that would say that that could be not commits where he actually does it, but where it's placed on him? Not that I'm aware of, uh, but as we've already seen today with Psalm 68 and Ephesians 4, where in that case the, the wording was changed, these, the idea that you're describing that the iniquity is placed upon him is certainly you know, clear in the Old Testament. I, I, would, I personally would think that that idea comes from elsewhere, like Isaiah 53. Um, but given that the New Testament writers do take thematic ideas from verses and then you know, adapt the wording to the point they want to make, you know, you could make that. What I would want to see is I would want to see a clear, a clear citation of, of these elements here with that change to know that, <coughs> that they were thinking of this passage, if, if you follow that. Okay. okay, again, just references here. From now on, this is Luke 2. From now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. Is Jesus reigning or not? I mean, you, you can't look at passages like this and say no. Okay, you, so in some sense, the kingdom is now. That, that's the only point. Acts 5, God, our Father has raised Jesus, exalted him to the right hand. Well, he's, he's either, he's exalted, but he's not really ruling. He's like, just kind of exalted. Well, like, what does that mean? Okay, again, if, if you're going to push all the kingdom stuff to the future... You just have to say crazy things like that. Well, it's not a real rule. It's like a, I love this, it's a spiritual rule, meaning it's not real. It's not like happening in real time. Well, I'm sorry, but the last time I checked, I live in real time. And frankly, divine beings live in real time as well because they're, they're, they're created beings. I mean, they, they're, they're not, they don't exist independent of any time at all. I mean, you can talk about the dimensional things and all that sort of stuff, but they are still subject to something. Only God is completely divorced from any, 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 anything we associate with time and space and all that kind of thing. Uh, he's the only one who can act independently of it. Or Luke 1 or 3, whatever. If, if you find it, let me know, and then we'll, we'll tell everybody. Acts 7, again the same. These are just references to Jesus at the right hand of God and reigning. 1 Peter 3, which we already saw. Continue with, uh, again, I, I've, I've entitled this, this set of slides, Problems with Prophecy. So we'll continue with that. And again, the goal is, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm telegraphing my position in that I'm in the already not yet camp. I believe the kingdom is here and will be consummated in the future. Uh, beyond that, the, the, those are the certainties. I mean, that reflects the stuff that I don't, I don't see how anybody can read the New Testament and not get those thoughts. The details, and there are lots of details that people are interested in, and lots of things that, you know, the, the Old New Testament talks about, or talk about, that become sort of, you know, areas of disagreement, areas of friction, you know, or things to, to think about. I think those are, are sort of window dressing to the important, more important areas. One of those, of course, is the idea of a rapture. Now, I, I, again, I'm, I'm hoping, I, I don't know what anybody's position is here, and again, I don't really care. What my goal is, is to show you that no view of this even even down to the exist whether one whether there is such a thing as a rapture at all or not, no view of this is self evident. Again, you don't just open your Bible and out pops my view. The Bible says so. The Bible tells me so. That's it, that's just fallacious, and if on, on a cranky day I would call it shallow. But since I'm not real cranky today, I'll just call it fallacious. <laughs> and what does um, that mean? False. Okay. I mean, it's just it's it. Yeah, it's a fallacy. It's a logical fallacy. 
doesn't mean the idea is false. It means the assumption that it's secure and certain and self-evident. The real question, as we'll see, is are you a splitter or a joiner? You have to decide that. There is no footnote, there is no appendix in your Bible that tells you which one to be. You say, well, what do you mean splitter or joiner? Well, let's jump in here and you'll find out. Illustration. Someone you're trying to disciple stops you after church and asks why the Gospels don't agree on what was written on the sign nailed to Jesus' cross. She wonders how the Gospel writers couldn't get something like that right. One or all of them must be wrong. Because they all don't agree. So how do you answer? Well, let, let's ask you what, you know, any of the, pick, pick any of these these sorts of issues where passage A and passage B don't quite say the same thing. What's the natural sort of way to, you know, that, that most people who, who care about such things would, how would they approach that? MikeHeiser.com. Yeah, there were, there were, <laughs> come on. <laughs> <laughs> That's a poor answer. <laughs> yeah, and I said it was a poor answer. So. Okay, I, I heard that. What, what did you? Okay, you mean the four go into two? Because there's four of them. <laughs> there's four different interpretations of what was written. Okay. I, what you're doing is, is you're, I think what you're doing is saying they all say the same thing. But I don't, I don't really like the word interpretation, at least for my purposes here. <laughs> well, I give a sermon, I say, I ask four different people what I said, and I get, come up with four different answers. Right. Now, let's say you Repeat do that. that for the take. He didn't go okay, he, he go said when, when he preaches a sermon, there, and he asks people what he, what he said, he'll get four different versions of what he said. Okay. But this was written. It doesn't matter. Okay. It doesn't matter. See, here's the thing. That needs to be followed by this question. Those four people you talk to after church, they might all be correct. Because they might be remembering select parts. Nobody's going to remember the entire whole and say it, even if they did, say it precisely the same way. But none of them are wrong. They're just, they're all right in different ways. So if you look at the superscriptions, they, they all disagree, but they're all pretty close, too. So we have, this is Jesus, King of the Jews, the King of the Jews, this is the King of the Jews, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. They all share King of the Jews, and some of them either omit or add a little something else. Like, here's the name, and then here's the name up here. So, most scholars would look at this, again, people who, who care about you know, the, the integrity of the record here, or who know that there would be poor thinking in regards to the integrity here, would say, look, chances are it said all this stuff. And the writers just, you know, it's 30, 40 years later, they're recollecting it, some of them might, you know, somebody might get the entire thing, you know, even though this one doesn't have this down here. They're all, they're all correct in that it conceivably either captures what was there or remembers only parts of what was there. But there's no false statement okay, made, that sort of thing. Yes, sir. Wasn't it written in several languages? It needs to go to the microphone. Yes. What, the question is, wasn't it written in several languages? Right? Yeah. I mean, it, it was. And you could... It's a, it's a fair bet that Luke... Mm, Luke probably knew Greek and Latin. Again, this is the Greco-Roman world. He's a Gentile, so I don't think we could really give him Hebrew or Aramaic. But the others were either at least bilingual and perhaps trilingual as well. So they could have been recollecting something from one of the other uh, languages. Yeah, it's possible. 
Let me give you a modern illustration. This is months ago, but Speaker Bonner on the House budget deal. Bang. Three sources, New York Times, Politico, and Reuters, were at the same press conference when Bonner is describing the House budget deal, and this is how they report it. We fought to keep government spending down because it really will, in fact, help create a better environment for job creators. This is the best deal we can get out of them. I am pleased Senator Reid and I in the White House have been able to come to an agreement, blah, 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 blah. Who's wrong? They all are. <laughs> <laughs> it's political trash. Okay. Not politically. <laughs> That was, that was a great comeback. <laughs> Who's wrong in terms of the reporting of the event and what was said? None of them are wrong. They're, they're just, it, it's selective. They're just putting what there what, what they want to put in because they have a word count, they're writing their story, you know. And an agenda. All, right, they have an agenda. They're, they're, there's any number of, of factors and parameters that go into why a writer selects what he selects to, to communicate a thought. And, and the Gospels are no different. <coughs> but here's what I want you to get. What I just described to you is the process or the impulse, and, or both, of harmonization. I joined them. Mm -hmm. I melded them in, into each other. This is something that happens, okay, it would be unusual to pick up an academic commentary uh, written again by someone loosely evangelical, you know, loosely conservative. Again, someone who, you don't even have to be conservative. I mean, there, there, are, there are critics who just know something this obvious, <laughs> okay? The overwhelming tendency is to harmonize things because we just know this is how life works a la right here it happens all the time you know I, I have i have i remember when the first war in iraq started i saved newspapers from that event if i went back and looked at them now and you could do the same thing with september 11 2001 same event and, and something that is just forefront in in, in the consciousness of, of the public mind saw it repeatedly over and over and over again. If you look at the news stories of that day and that event, nobody's going to have it exactly the same, it include all the same elements with all the same words. Question. If you had three newspapers from three different parts of the country, and you read their account of September 11th, the Twin Towers store, uh, event, and they all did contain all the same elements, and all the same words. What would you think? Either the same person's writing all three, or there's a whole lot of plagiarizing going on. <laughs> okay, I know when I get papers from students, and I save all of them. And I there's a reason I ask them to be submitted digitally. <laughs> I can search them. I can put them all in a little folder and search them simultaneously. It's so convenient. I know. I also read them. <laughs> if I see a paper, and this has happened to me, that there's just an overwhelming amount of agreement, I immediately am not a joiner. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, oh, this is just, you know, it's just two people working separately, and it, you know, it just happened to be really, no. I mean, I, I'm thinking that we've got plagiarism going on here. So it, it, it's a good thing to have the disparity, you know, both in terms of, especially in terms of the New Testament, because it tells you they're not copying off each other. Right? They're not, you know, one guy didn't write this, and it's like, oh, man. I want a gospel too. I want my name on a book. You know, I'm going to go. That is not what happened. So it's important to have the difference. But again, that's the tendency to bring together, again, to join, to harmonize. That is a critical issue. 
for the rapture thing because there are a whole number of descriptions, Old and New Testament, about the, the coming of the Lord, the day of the Lord, you know, the coming, you know, Jesus' return and all this stuff. And if you harmonize them, you have one event. It's called the second coming. If you separate them, you have two events. One's called the rapture, the other one's called the second coming. That is a decision you make in your head. So the typical pre-mill, pre-trib rapture view, again, church age, rapture here, seven-year tribulation, then we have the second coming, and a thousand-year millennium, new heaven, new earth. I'm, I'm sure all this is quite familiar. So do we have one event or two? This depicts two. And what we're really asking is, are you splitting the information or are you going to join the information? Because if you join, you only have this one. Okay. First Thessalonians 4. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of a command or with a shout, some translations have, with the voice of an archangel, sound of the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. And we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Okay? This is, this is like one of the, the central passages to this whole debate. So we have a description of some sort of return of Christ here. And then you have Zechariah 4, which again, everybody, regardless of their view, believes is eschatological. Okay? It has to do with end times. Not the first coming, but the second. Then the Lord will go out, fight against those nations, fights on a day of battle. And here's the event. On that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley so that one half of the mount shall move northward, the other half southward. Now, other than taking everything in here literally, the, especially if you do, the assumption is that this event is different than this one. Okay, because, well, here the feet don't touch the, the earth, and there's no, like, Mount of Olives thing, and, you know, there's none of this splitting language and all that kind of stuff. So, they must be two events. If we understand them both literally, especially, we would want to see two events there. Others would say, hey, this is just general description to indicate the cataclysmic part of the day of the Lord. This is the second coming. Uh, you know, the, the Lord returns, and the nations are going to, you know, the enemies of his people are going to get routed, and then he ushers in the kingdom, and there's blessing and all this stuff. Okay, they would say this is the, the, you know, there's no reason to split them. Let's join them. Let's just say that there are different elements in the two that describe the same thing. So which, who's right? Do I split or join? I don't know. Depending on what I do, will give me one event or two. So 1 Thessalonians 4, let's look at some other things. We have certain elements in this. We've got a cry, a command, archangel, trumpet, caught up together, meet the Lord in the air. So those are your elements in 1 Thessalonians 4. And lo and behold... We have those elements here in Matthew 24. Clouds, angels, trumpet call, gathering together of the elect, you know, from one end of the heaven to the other. Um, you say, well, you know, what happened to the shout? You know, this, we're missing the shout. Well, again, you got four out of five, that ain't bad. <laughs> Notice the verse 30 comes after verse 15. <laughs> so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place let the reader understand let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains but for the sake of the elect those days will be cut short this comes after that so here's the question does this refer back to this 
if you say yes, you cannot have a pre-trib rapture. If you believe in a rapture, it can't be pre-trib because of the abomination of desolation. Again, and everybody who believes the rapture believes that the 70th week of Daniel, at the midpoint, you have the abomination. So this happens after. This is why pre-trib rapturists say, oh, this isn't the rapture, Mike. That's the second coming. The rapture's already happened before the tribulation. Well, okay, if that's the second coming, why do we get all these things that are here? Is that the second coming? If you say that's the second coming, then why do you have a rapture in the first place? And you, you see the problem? And it, it's which ones to join and which ones to split. So you have two questions. The split or, split or join question, fundamentally. And then when you make your decision to split, then the question becomes, which ones do I match up? Which ones do I align and which ones do I separate? These are arbitrary choices. Okay? If you believe in a rapture, okay? You, you decide, it gets down to you deciding the degree of sameness that you like or the degree of difference that you dislike. I mean, it, it, it's, these are interpretive decisions that are made inside your head or that you hear from somebody else and they made them in their head. Um, this is not easy. I mean, these are not easy things to decide. It's not self-evident. You know, let's talk about imminence, whatever that means. You really have three choices. Does imminence mean Jesus could return in the next eye blink? That is, there's nothing preventing it. There's nothing that has to happen. Right? Nothing at all so that the Lord would, would return. Is that what imminence means? Does it mean that Jesus will return soon? There may be some things that you know, still need to fall into place, and then, then the Lord will come back. Or does it mean Jesus will return unexpectedly? he will be caught by surprise. Which one is it? Signs, such as the revealing of Antichrist, have signs in the sky and so on and so forth, are relegated to the second coming only to maintain view number one. The only view of end times that says this is the pre-trib rapture. All other views of the second coming, whether they believe in a rapture or not, all other views of the second coming and or the rapture define imminence one of these two ways. The pre-trib position is the only one that says this. There are passages in 2 Thessalonians 1 that say, that talk about how the, the man of sin needs to be revealed before the Lord's return. Now, a pre-tribber will say, oh, well, he's talking about the second coming. He's not talking about the rapture because the Lord could come back at any moment. You see what I'm doing there? His foot I'm, doesn't touch the earth. Right. I'm self-styling. I'm filtering the passage through a position. And, and, and that, that's not a crime, because everybody does that, is my point. Everybody does that. If I don't believe in a rapture, I'd, I'd say, come on, the passage says that the man of sin has to be revealed first before the Lord returns. And I'm a joiner. I don't, I don't really care about the differences in, in the return descriptions, because I think, like the Gospels, I think they just relate parts of the same greater event. I join them. I only have one second coming. And so before that second coming happens, I, I'll, you know, some, something will tell us, the believing community, that the Antichrist has been revealed. And after that, then, you know, then I'm going to start looking like you know, the Lord can come back. Because you know, this thing happened. Signs in the sky. Okay, Jesus in Matthew 24 talks about signs in the sky that would precipitate precede his coming. Well, Mike, that's only the second coming. That doesn't have anything to do with the rapture. Again, you see what I'm doing. I'm assuming two events, before the first before which nothing needs to happen. But if you put them together, you cannot say this. You not only cannot, you, you wouldn't. You just won't. You don't want to. Because then you, you know, that's your own contradiction. 
First Thessalonians 5 is kind of interesting. Go ahead. I heard a I heard a guy he gave like it's called he called it the powerful preachers view. Mm -hmm. And he said that Matthew like parts of Matthew twenty four were talking about the Romans destroying Jerusalem. Is that does that make any sense at all? If you're a partial preterist. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it makes perfect sense if you're a partial pre and I'm answering it that way because that's the answer. Yeah. <laughs> right. In other words, if I presuppose that position, it makes beautiful sense. You know, a preterism is the idea that, again that that you know, a certain amount of, of, of prophecy, in that case partial, so he's not a full preterist. A certain amount of, of prophecy, even New Testament prophecy, has already been fulfilled. And the, the, the key event is usually the destruction of Jerusalem. So, I get to a preterist position along the lines of certain assumptions. One of which is, the book of Revelation was written before 70 AD. I have to have that. To be a preterist in any sense, I must have it. Because if, if, if I don't, well then what's the sense of preterism? Then it's all, all this language doesn't pertain to the destruction of Jerusalem. It must pertain to something future. I, I, you know, I've just blown my preterism apart if I don't have the book of Revelation prior to 70. And again, you, you can make arguments in favor of of the book of Revelation being authored before 70 AD. Yeah, the, the, one of the key issues is there's a reference to the court of the Gentiles and the sanctuary in the book of Revelation. Well, this, this is kind of funny because the, preteril, the preterist has to interpret that literally. That has to be like the real temple, still, you know, still standing. Uh, because then the, then the language is talking about Titus, and he's going to come in and destroy the sanctuary and all this stuff. Because if it's written after 90, I'm not talking about the real sanctuary, because, man, that's history. It's 20 years ago. You know, it, so there, there are little things like that, but you need that. So if you argue that and you like that, then what you just asked, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> Every view can articulate itself extending and extending from its own presuppositions so that it looks beautiful, beautifully coherent. How could anybody not believe, oh, it just works so well. Why is it that they all say that? <laughs> because they all make different presumptions and proceed therefrom. And then they pretend, oh, well, this is what the Bible says. Well, you're taking what the Bible says and you're filtering it through this thing. That's really where your, your position comes from. And again, that's not a crime. We all do that. The only way to not do that is just not to care. That's kind of where I'm at. <laughs> Whatever. You know, I tell people I'm a, I'm a pro-millennialist. I'm in favor of it. <laughs> I like that idea. Amen. It's a little bit of a lie because, again, I think it's too restrictive. But, you know, they get the point. But, you know, if you, if you really feel compelled... When I say I don't care, what I mean is I don't feel compelled to have to pick. Yeah. But if you feel compelled to pick, pick something and, and enjoy it, love it, you know, live, live by it. That, that's great. It's just that you, what you need to do is you need to realize why you hold that position. You hold it because you've made certain assumptions and you're comfortable with them and it, it works for you. Great. But So be charitable to the person who does the same thing but doesn't quite do it the way you do. Go ahead. Excommunication. Every denomination in their creed takes a position and if basically if you don't march lockstep with them, you're going to be put on the rack. <laughs> well, I mean, they're not that I, terrible in I, churches. A lot of churches aren't, but I I, I think I think you're you're overstating the negative case, because a lot of a lot of denominations will say something like, "We believe in the return of the Lord." Well, everybody believes that. In other words, 
I, I don't know that it's true denominationally because that's that's a, a big structure. But uh, individual churches will will wise up and make their doctrinal statements more broad to allow you know for disagreement. But you're you're correct. A lot of them don't do that. You know, and 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 to be fair to them. They've made the decision as a congregation or the, the, the pastoral leadership has made a decision that we are going to take this position and we're going to insist upon it so that people who come here are comfortable. In other words, if you come here, you know this position and you like this position, that's part of the reason you're coming here. And so we're, not, we're, we're telling you we're not going to rattle your cage by bringing in a different view. Now, I look at that, and it's just me, I look at that and say, I understand that, and that probably gives your people security, but it doesn't help them think. Yeah. So, I, I sort of gravitate toward the thinking is important, and we don't need to protect people from the Bible position. But I, at the same time, and I'm not being flippant when I say it that way, at the same time, I understand that a lot of people, because of where they're at in their Christian life, or you know, a, a number of factors, they need that security. They need people to tell them the checklist. I understand that. What I want to hear from you, O oh holder of the checklist, is that you realize that that is not a growth position. That, that at some point, certain people will, will need more than that. And either you need to be willing to give that to them in some way so that you don't ruffle feathers over here, or you need to bless them and encourage them to go somewhere else. In other words, you know, don't don't browbeat them, you know, for for needing more than that. Um, and I, you're probably standing there thinking, "Boy, is that naive?" You know. <laughs> yeah. It, this is it not maybe. Really <laughs> I think we need to get back to. Oh yeah. This. Yeah, you're right. You're right, Sharon. Thank you for that. First Thessalonians 5. Again, we've read this a lot. Now concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. You're sure, you're fully aware the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. You know, people say there's peace and security. And, you know, we, we, we've all read the passage. But have you ever looked at the pronouns? Probably not. So this, is, this is, again, a geeky thing to do. <laughs> look, at the pro, look at the pronouns and, and the nouns they're attached to. Now, concerning the times and seasons, brothers, I put brothers in red, and anything in red would be Christians, fellow Christians. Concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. You guys know. You guys know all about the times and the seasons. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When people, somebody else, the other crowd, are saying, oh, there's peace and security. Then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers. You won't be surprised like the thief in the night. You'll know. Or you, I mean, you'll have some inkling. I mean, you'll, you'll have a sense of what's going to happen. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, others, but let us keep awake and be sober. Now, you could easily go through that, paying attention to the pronouns, and argue this. The first view of imminence does not, this, this does not describe the first view of imminence, that there will be things you see and know that precede, that, that inform you that the Lord is about to return. Okay? You say, oh, Mike, of course, that refers to the second coming. Of course we'll know, you know, when the second coming, and whoever's on earth, you know, people who get saved after the rapture, they'll know because then there's the signs in the sky and there's the revealing of the Antichrist. And, but, okay, you've just assumed, again, that you have two events instead of one. Again, what I'm trying to show you is that you can go to these passages and you can filter them a variety of ways. You can parse them a variety of ways. 
based upon, again, certain assumptions that are brought to them. Let's talk about the 70th week of Daniel. Is it fulfilled or is it future? Again, we have our pre-trib scheme up here. Seven-year tribulation. This is the, the key concept that is attached to this whole 70th week of Daniel thing. And I have Matthew 24 here because, again, it, it's just it's representative of this. There will be great tribulation such as not been from the beginning of the world. So the references to these great tribulation are in this view, the pre-mill, pre-trib, or, or any, any view of the rapture. You can have a mid-trib or a pre-wrath or a post-trib. Uh, they all want to see a seven-year, a specific seven-year period of tribulation after what is referred to as the church age, you know, the, the current times, that there will be some indication that we've moved into a seven-year ticking clock time period, okay? Now here's Daniel 9 with the 70 weeks. 70 weeks are decreed about your people, your holy city, to finish the transgression of this whole list. We have a reference to the 70. You know, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal the vision, and anoint the most holy place. Then down here, we have 62 weeks. After 62 weeks, it will be built again with squares and open in a troubled time. And the anointed one will be cut off after this 62. And then I should say down here, there's one other week. Assumption number one. The 70 weeks are seven period, 70 periods of seven years. That's an assumption. And the 70th week is therefore 70 years. So if this is true, if the 70 weeks are 70 periods of seven years, then the last one logically would also be seven years. Okay? Here are two more assumptions. The Great Tribulation is seven years long. Therefore, the 70th week of Daniel is the Great Tribulation perfectly coherent in terms of its logic, but with any syllogism, you have to ask, are the premises sound? Okay, how sound are they? These two are the trouble spots. This one, most scholars would say, yeah, the weeks are seven years. I'm not going to worry about that. And so that would mean the last one is also seven years. Not everybody says that. I'll show you an exception, but most people do. These two are the trouble spots because if I click this, it would open up my software. If you search for the word tribulation in the New Testament, it never occurs with the numeral seven. There is no verse that defines the tribulation in terms of seven years. That's a guess. It's an assumption. It's a deduction. Okay? And I added that search in here, too, where I put in tribulation and seven, or the word weak. They do not occur together. So here's the, here's the issue. I'm, go, I'm still going to believe that there is a tribulation, because Matthew says there's a period of tribulation. I mean, that much, you know, it, it seems like I'm okay to say. Again, speaking as, you know, someone who you know, wants to hold this view, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take that as a specific time period, and I'm going to take it as seven years, because that's, that seems logical. Okay. Another view would say, I really don't want to take that position because I don't have a verse that justifies it. Okay. Both of them, I, I think, can be honest positions if the first one says, yeah, I don't have a verse, but it I'm going to go there anyway, because it seems reasonable. All right, well, I can see how it would seem reasonable. Again, you're, you're making some you know, guesses and deductive reasoning. Everybody does that somewhere. Fine. What I want you to see is it's not self-evident. Assumption two. This one's kind of mind-blowing. It's assumed that there was only one set of 70 weeks. And that set is 490 years. 70 weeks are decreed. And that, was, that 70 is later repeated. This is the assumption, later repeated.
here, 7, 62, and 1. That the whole description is describing the same set of 70 weeks. That's, right, that's the, 7 and 62 is 69 plus 1 is 70. So this is sort of the, gives you the whole number, and then it re-describes it down here. So we have one set of 70 weeks. What if, well, before I get to the what if, uh, I might want to skip this too. If you take the one set of views, if you take the one set view, then you have to make certain other assumptions as to when it starts, when the 70 weeks start. And this people in the holy city down in verse 20, or verse 24, the assumption is that the uh, finish the transgression, putting an end to sin, atone for iniquity, the assumption is that that describes the crucifixion and the atoning sacrifice of Christ. So we need to have all of the weeks you know, either end with that or somehow revolve around this event. And we're going to get to this assumption about whether this really refers to the crucifixion or not. And here are your options as to when to start the 70 weeks. Okay, let's just move on beyond that. Here's what I really want to get to. What if there are two sets? 70 weeks are decreed. And what if we assume that this is describing one <coughs> series of 70 weeks and a series of events associated with that 70? And then we draw a line here, and this is another set. Then that means that this talk about the atonement for iniquity and all this kind of stuff does not refer, it cannot refer, to the crucifixion and stuff like that, because that would be described down here, the abomination of desolation and whatnot. You know, or maybe it does, and then this has you know, something to do eschatologically. There, there, there are just so many layers and, and, and positions you could take on this, depending on whether you see this as a summary and then this repeats that, or whether you believe there are two sets. Well, what's the right answer? Well, I don't know. I don't. Could be either. If you take, uh, you know, if, if you do this division of sets, the first set, and you'll notice that it's only 70 years, and I'll tell you how, how <coughs> they justify that. The first set refers to the exile and then up to close to the time of Nehemiah. And then the second set would pick up from there and go to 490 years to the crucifixion. That's another way you can look at it. Isn't this fun? You just like 10 different ways to look at this. <laughs> you say, isn't it cheating to have weeks in the first set only be one year per week for a total of 70 years? But then you have the second set be, you know, 70 weeks of 490. Isn't that cheating? Don't you just, isn't that kind of manipulative? That yeah, kind of, but there's actually a justification for it. <laughs> First option, let's say there's chronological evidence that seven refers to every seventh year of a sabbatical cycle. So 77s is one year 70 times. That's possible. Second option would be, again, there's also evidence from elsewhere in Scripture that a seven-year sabbatical cycle itself was considered one week. So then you'd have 490. Which one do I like? Well, it depends on which scheme I like. Again, I'm making choices. There's nothing that tells me, you can't have this one, but you must have that one. There's nothing that tells you that. If you're going with the one week is one year, you'd go to Leviticus 25, and you'd you know, do the whole every seventh year thing. That's the passage you like. And you get further justification from Second Chronicles 36. He took into exile in Babylon those who had escaped from the sword. They became servants to him and to his sons until the establishment of the kingdom of Persia. This describes the exile. To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths. Okay. 
70 years, right there. It says it, 70 years. And so there are those who would take Second Chronicles 36 and the, and the exile itself and the language of the Sabbaths and say, that adds up to obviously 70 years. And, and the Sabbath week, every seventh year, one year, is what Daniel 9 is talking about. Okay? Sounds great. And again, for people who take that view, they can take that and then articulate and expand upon it through the rest of their eschatology. And it looks beautiful. It looks wonderful. Second option, this 490, you could also go to Leviticus 26 and do this. If in spite of this you will not listen to me, then I will discipline you again sevenfold for your sins. Seventy times seven. The Seventy earlier in Leviticus 26 with the Sabbath is 490. I like that one. I like that view. In fact, I like both of them so much, I'm going to choose them both and have two sets of 70. I mean, how do you know? How do you know? Assumption 3. Verse 24 is about Jesus' atoning sacrifice. And because you got this, put an end to sin, atone for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness. Again, th this is a very, this is an extremely common assumption. Assuming we have 70 weeks, 490 years, and end with the crucifixion, how does verse 24 work if it does in fact speak of Jesus' atoning death? So what is the scope of Jesus' atoning death? What does it cover? Does it cover only the Jews? Because that's who the 70 weeks prophecy is aimed at, your people in your city. That's a new spin on limited atonement right there. It's only for Jewish people. Did the death of Jesus put an end to sin? Well, it kind of depends how you massage that idea. Right? Did it really put an end to sin? I mean, what does that mean? It certainly didn't put an end to sinning. So, like, if there, if somebody sins after the resurrection, then sin is still around. You know, you see what I mean. I mean, how do you fit the language to what what's going on? Did the death of Jesus atone for iniquity? This is the one because it, it certainly seems quite clear that leads people to latch onto this and then interpret the rest of them in light of that one. But. When you get into this everlasting righteousness, seal up the vision and prophecy, anoint a most holy place, did the death of Jesus do this? Okay, did it bring in everlasting righteousness? Did it anoint a most holy place? Like, well, what, what would that be? The way you can understand this to atone for iniquity is if you take that view, the first view that the 70 is the 70 years of captivity, then this language is about the end of the captivity and the return to Jerusalem and the rebuilding of the temple to anoint the most holy place. And I can make a case for that. What if it was about the end of the exile? So we have the 70 year exile, finish the transgression, put an end to sin. Israel's forgiven. Okay? They're forgiven. The transgression is over. That, that's over and done with. Their iniquity has been atoned for. And to bring in everlasting righteousness, some would, scholars would suggest that lasting vindication would be a better way to put that, based upon something going on in Daniel 8. To seal both vision and prophet. Whose vision? Which prophet? Well, the ones that prophesied about the exile. Their prophecy was fulfilled now. And the holy place is the temple. You, you see how the, you can coherently do that. So, you know, which, which one is which? Go ahead. Is there a connection with the, uh, in the New Testament, Jesus talks about forgiving 70 times 7? I, I think if, if, there is an, if there is an allusion back to that, again, based on the Leviticus thing, I think it would be by analogy, but... That's that's also like idiomatic. It's 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 a Hebrew idiom that shows up in other contexts. 
that means consistently and fully without reneging, you know, on, on your forgiveness, that kind of thing. So I, I, I couldn't say with certainty that it's an actual reference back to that specific idea or passage. Another assumption, the anointed one of verse 26a, after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off. You know, that must be Jesus. Okay, assumption that the anointed one of verse 26a is not the prince of verse 26b, the second half of the verse. So here we have, you know, you're, you're 62, you're anointed one, and then this prince. Well, in verse 25, both terms are used in the same <coughs> verse. So the question becomes, are these, is this two people or one? Is, do we have an anointed one and a prince? Are they two separate people? Or is this, uh, pardon the, gr the grammatical speak, is this appositional? Is this dis just a way of describing that? Okay, depending on how you answer that, you know, when you come down here, okay, you've got seven weeks and 62 because they're going to be associated with this issue. Let's just go down here. You've got an anointed one of prince, there shall be seven weeks, okay, from, let's go to the, back to the, here to the chronology. You know, therefore, and understand from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem, to the coming of an anointed prince, an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Okay, so we've got probably one person here associated with one period. Then for the 62 weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. And after the 62 weeks an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city. So here's the question. Because this period was associated with both terms, should I take this period, the 62, and associate it with both terms as though they're one person, like they were up here, or do I make them two people? Right. Okay, so this, this view is obviously splitting them. You shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and so on and so forth. So, you, you, you have this issue, and again, this anointed one would be different than this anointed one. There are those who, though, because they see all this as happening not in the future, but in the period of Antiochus. Okay, remember the guy who goes in and slays the pig on the altar and stuff like that? They would say that you can, you know, combine these things, and they would usually take these these references here as some sort of you know, chronological symbolism or something. And again, you, know, you say, well, that's a cop-out to say it's symbolic. Well, you know, to some people it's not. And you come down here and you have you know, one and the same. Who knows? Okay. Is this what we should do? Keep the colors the same? It's hard to know. So the questions, again, associated with this, why is there no verse that makes this equation? Why is there no mention of seven years in the book of Revelation? Did you realize that? <laughs> the book of Revelation never even talks about seven years. Now it talks about three and a halfs and 1260s. But then the question becomes, do I add them or is it talking about the same set? I don't know. Right? And if there is a 1260, does that require... You know, if there is a three and a half, does that require a seven? Again, the, you could easily say, well, yes, that makes sense. You know, three and a half. Why would it be three and a half? And that, is, it, is it coincidental that that's half a seven? And, you know, maybe we should be looking at this as a seven year. I don't know. You know, I, I just, I don't know. I, I, can, I can go either way and make sense of it. As I go along, I make a series of assumptions and logical deductions. But there's nothing that actually tells me that in, in either direction. Again, no mention of weeks in Revelation. Boy, it should be nice to have the word week show up in Revelation, if that was the point. Why is Daniel 9, 24 to 27 never quoted in the book of Revelation? It should sure be nice to have that, wouldn't it? You say, well, you don't need it quoted. You just kind of need, like, allusions to, to things in there, like, 
like, uh, oh no, wait, we don't have seven. We don't have weeks. <laughs> like what? <laughs> you know what I mean? It, but what, what you do is you, you, you start with Daniel 9, and you work out a scheme so that you have a view of Daniel 9 in, in, a, in a broad sweep of activity. And then you take that broad sweep of activity, and then you take that whole thing to Revelation. That's how you do it. Well, it's cheating. You know, some would say it's cheating. Others would say, no, it's not cheating. I'm just taking a bigger view. Again, I can argue any side of this. Temple will be rebuilt. Oh, what could be more obvious? Basis for a literal temple. Well, everybody goes to Ezekiel 40 and 48. And they like Daniel 9, 24 and 27 because, hey, it, it alludes to the ceasing of sacrifices and offerings, and you've got to have a temple for that. Yeah, you do, but if you do, it gets destroyed. Nobody ever like, seems to think you know, see that. Um, because they usually want the temple rebuilt for the millennium, okay, for the return of the king. And then there's this whole discussion, do we have sacrifices in the millennium or not? You know, why would we do that if Jesus is the sacrifice? And, well, you need to step back here a little bit and realize that the temple here, if, and the, the word never occurs, but if the sacrifices and offerings speak of a temple, it gets destroyed. Right in the verse. Okay, so then we have a, a, a third temple, or actually be a fourth temple, because the next one will be the third if there is a next one. So like how many temples do we need? And, and again, this is being a little snippy here, but I'm, I'm going to do it only for the sake of the illustration. How many temples do you need? As many as, as you need for the system to work. <laughs> That's how many you need. You either need none or two more, or one, you know, Again, you're extrapolating to make the system coherent. So on Ezekiel 40 and 48, well, it has dimensions. It must be literal because it talks about height and width and, you know, all this kind of stuff. It must be literal. Well, Ezekiel 43, again, right in that 40 to 48 section. Well, the man was standing beside me. I heard, him, heard one speaking to me out of the temple. And he said, Son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the people of Israel forever. And the house of Israel shall no more defile my holy name, neither they nor their kings, by their whoring and by the dead bodies of their kings at the high places. So this idea right here, this is the place of my throne, the soles of my feet, where I will dwell in the midst of the people of Israel forever. Same language is back here in Ezekiel 37. And again, this is the, the dry bones thing. I will set them in their land and multiply them and set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. My dwelling place shall be with them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. Universally taken as evidence for the rebuilding of a temple for the kingdom. This gets quoted in the New Testament. Unfortunately for some, fortunately for others. Again, it just depends on, on how you're going to construct your system. <sighs> Paul. Paul, you're a mess. What accord has Christ with Belial? What portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God said. I will make my dwelling among them, walk among them, be their God, they shall be my people. You know, again... This is all true, and again, this is all pertaining to the church. And so those who, who want to argue for a future literal temple will say, this is all true, but again, there's this already not yet idea. And so while this is not, we're not going to deny this, we're still going to expect a literal temple because of the references in Daniel and blah, 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 blah. I mean, again, you, you, can, you can go with any system you like. By the way, back here, we are the temple of the living God. Do you not know that you, plural, are God's temple? Again, Paul writing to the Corinthians. This is, this is plural in the Greek, the pronoun. So it refers corporately to the, the group of believers there as God's temple and God's spirit is dwelling in them. And three chapters later, your body, these are singular, the Holy Spirit is within you. Okay, you're the temple individually. So you actually get both in 1 Corinthians. You get a reference to the, 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 the corporate group of believers as the temple and the individual person as the temple. 
Book of Revelation, linear sequence or something else? There's two slides. Do I have time to, to hit this? Yeah, it's, a le it's 10 after 11. Okay. There are two slides here. And this is something that is probably unfamiliar to most of you, and it'll, it'll take... I'm hoping that... The way I've put, uh, constructed it here, that you'll you'll see this. This is Revelation. I've taken the. This isn't original with me. I I got this from a, a commentary on Revelation, but it goes from chapter six to the end of the book. So it, it's the stuff after the letters, you know, to the churches, the seven churches. Now you'll notice that there is patterning, persecution. You know, persecution, day of wrath, and salvation, and some scene in heaven. And then in a couple of places, that sequence is interrupted by the assembling of an army for a final battle prior to the day of wrath. But you can see there, there's clear patterning. What do you notice about the verse, the, the chapter references? Trace the flow of the chapters. Beginning up here. Which way do they go? Up. What do you mean by up? To go up, you first have to go. Goes this way. And it starts up here, comes back down. Starts up here, comes back down. Starts up here and comes back down. Up, down, up, down. What we usually do is we start here and we go straight to here. You know, we go in a line. But maybe the book of Revelation is meant to cycle through the same series of events six times. If you read Revelation that way, you do not have a, chrono you do not have a chronology of end time events. That just isn't the point of the book at all. The point of the book would be thematically talking about persecution of believers and there's going to be a final battle and God will come and deliver his people and destroy the enemy and then we get to go to heaven. It just describes it six times. And they're not all the same, but they're very similar. So here's the question. How should I read the book of Revelation? And this isn't the only alternative system. This is probably the one that, given the way it's set up, you can see, you know, creates a reading possibility. How should I read the book of Revelation? I just, you know, I thought it was like giving me this, this nice flow of everything that's going to happen in time, one after the other, after the other. Maybe not. I don't know. Again, since every element isn't precisely identical... I'm going to be a splitter, man. I don't, I don't like that at all. I'd rather just read it chronologically, and they're all separate events, but you know, maybe related, and it's a linear chronology. And then if somebody else will say, "No, oh, that's kind of cool. You know, it's just up and down, up and down." Up. You know, that can't be coincidental. Who knows? But that that dramatically affects the way you look at the whole book. Now there were. A couple of questions. Actually, one was from yesterday, and, and we didn't we didn't hit this yesterday because I actually answered it. I think on the first day. Uh, if there was only to be life in the temple where God was, then why were there so many animal sacrifices? I made the comment that the sacrifice was conceived of as giving the animals life back to God, uh, but the, the carcasses were to be disposed of outside of sanctified areas, and the ashes as well. So. Uh, it, it's it's not there's not an incongruence there with sacrifice and life. You're just you're giving the life back to God. Uh, and then there's one just now. What is your definition of the abomination of def desolation? Uh, <clears throat> the language in the text about the abomination is is quite cryptic and obtuse. I would say that there are a number of possibilities here, and they all fall under the notion of defilement of, of the sanctuary itself, defilement of the holy place, or some sort of act of sacrilege. And that, that's about as far as I take it. Uh, I, don't, I don't like to speculate on specifics when I don't really have anything to hang my hat on uh, in that regard. 
I do think the Antiochus event uh, is is worth uh, looking at for its typology, as far as you know, sacrificing a pig on the altar and that sort of thing, and declaring himself to be God. And, um, we don't actually have the specifics repeated uh, anywhere, you know, after Daniel. Uh, all we have is the phrase that's associated with it. So I, I'm not willing to say that the same ritual acts will occur, but I am willing to say that there's some sort of act of defilement and blasphemy uh, that occurs there. So that's just a quick run through of that. What I want to do now is uh, flip through some prophetic topics and, you know, put a divine council flavoring on, on certain things. And also, you know, just, just to show you that there are, some, there are some interesting ways that certain issues get approached uh, in, in the academic literature that you might not be aware of. So we saw the, this flow here, assumptions, the bias, some problems and flaws. We sort of tracked through that last time. And we want to hit on some of this. Again, not so much, you know, curiosities, but I'll, I'll mention a few things that uh, might be worth thinking about, but they're, they're speculative. So as far as points of clarity, now this is the part where I'm, I'm essentially going to tell you what I feel really comfortable saying and, and what I feel we have a, a high degree of certainty uh, about. I think that the kingdom has been inaugurated in the first coming, the first advent, and these ideas right here are, in my view, painfully evident in the New Testament. I just don't see how you can miss them. Satan is, I use the word disbarred because I'm, I'm playing on the, the office of the Satan there, the accuser. And I made the comment that he's essentially a prosecutor without a perp when it comes to Christians. It's just, just a pointless, pointless activity uh, in, in terms of accusing Christians, laying some claim on them that they will die and go to the underworld where he is their owner. Uh, that just isn't the case anymore. The gods are disqualified uh, from their jobs. They will be displaced, the gods of the nations. The nations, again, are sort of in default in terms of their ownership. Um, they, are, they, are, they are being repossessed. The nations are being repossessed, if we can use that language. The kingdom is a global force uh, identified with the church. The kingdom present, again, the, the king present as the spirit, the spirit who is Jesus, is but isn't Jesus, that sort of thing. So, again, these, these are ideas, I think, that are pretty clear from the text. Now, the consummation, the final, you know, the apex of these things would be Satan is going to be eliminated and done away with. The gods are going to be dethroned and eliminated the nations will be completely repossessed. The kingdom will be a global presence as a new Eden. And the king will be present incarnate. Again, these are, these are my basic positions. So I believe in, a, in the kingdom already being here, but not yet in its fullness. Uh, I think the Lord will return. I think we will have uh, the Lord on earth with his people in his global kingdom. And in my view, I, I, I merge that with the idea of a new heaven and new earth, i.e. the eternal state. So I appreciate the, you know, I, I like the amillennialists over here, <laughs> and I like the premillennialists over here, but I don't like the term millennium. <laughs> yeah, because I think it's just too restrictive. So we're going to focus on these things and see some divine counsel favoring here. So moving forward to the past, the new Eden. I hit this last year, so I, I, will, I will do this a, a bit quickly. I think that the, this might be a good way to frame it. We have the human family of believers who will join the divine family. I do not believe that we all get to become Yahweh's and then we get our own planets and, you know, I'm not a Mormon, 
<laughs> Let's just put it that way. Um, I don't get a bunch of wives in the future. No, no, you don't get a bunch of wives or anything like that. So. But there is a sense that there is a New Testament doctrine of what scholars call theosis, becoming divine. Okay, we become like him, but we don't become him. Right? There's a difference there. And these passages talk about that. You know, I, I like 1 John 3. You know, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God. And then John adds, and that is what we are. Uh, you know, it's just sort of putting the, uh, the emphasis on it there. And it talks about being like him, we'll be like him, you know, we'll be as he is, we'll see him as he is and be like him. Second Peter 2, again, we have become partakers of the divine nature. Again, all this language in the New Testament. Uh, Romans 8, creation is awaiting in travail, the, 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 the arrival, the, the culmination, the unveiling of the sons of God who are us. Ephesians 1, again, all this language pertains to that. And we have this, the one who overcomes and conquers, uh, if somebody can go quickly to Revelation 2, uh, Revelation 2, look up verse 7 quickly. Go ahead and read verse 11. He who is able to hear, let him listen to and heed what the Spirit says to the assemblies, the churches. He who overcomes shall in no way be injured by the second death. Okay. Go ahead and read verse 17. He who is able to hear, let him listen to and heed what the Spirit says to the assemblies. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat the manna that is hidden, and I will give him a white stone with a new name engraved on a stone which no one knows or understands except he who receives it. Okay. La last one. We might as well do chapter 3, verse 5 and 12. There's some patterning going on here that I'll draw your attention to. Thus says he who conquers, be clad in white garments and I will not erase or blot out his name from the book of life. I will acknowledge him as mine, and I will confess his name openly before my father and before his angels. And this twelve. Mm -hmm. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the sanctuary of my God. He shall never be put out of it or go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which he sends from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. Okay, all of those, thank you, all of those are prefaced with the phrase, he who overcomes, the one who overcomes. And they all have something to do with membership, permanent membership, in the family and the council, the presence of God. Because you get some temple imagery there, sort of equating us with pillars in the temple and that sort of thing. In the next slide, or the, next, the next part of the discussion, the same phrase is going to be used of believers as well with respect to being put over the nations. So you actually have Revelation, and again, they, they all occur in the section of Revelation that is speaking to the churches, i.e. believers. Okay, So the book of Revelation is starting to describe a restoration of the original Edenic in intent. That to him that overcomes, believers will become with God, part of the council, part of the, the bureaucratic ruling structure, and part of God's family. And it, it's, just, it's using this, this language in this way, again, the overcoming language, to speak of permanent membership in these institutions. And the same thing is hinted at in these over here. Go ahead, Sharon. Flip uh, to the in the midst one. of all that, um, there was um, Revelation 2, 26. Is that on the next slide? Which says, here. is it? Is it? Yep. Okay. I'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was highlighted. Okay. Highlight. <laughs> again, ex expanding you know, again from this, 
again, we have this phrase, and the phrase is connected with, with our, our, our becoming part of the divine family, becoming, you know, partaking of the divine nature, uh, becoming a, a permanent fixture in the presence of God. You know, that, that sort of idea. And to expand on that, again, we, we did this last year, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but in Ephesians 1, again, we, we get some of this, this repetition, and down here as well, where believers are referred to as hagioi. I, I really dislike the translation saints. I really wish it would be translated holy ones, because that's the way English translations tend to do it in the Old Testament. So if you don't translate it the same way both times, you lose the connection. You know, it's easy to make the mental connection. If, if we're thinking of ourselves as holy ones here, it's easy to sort of go back to the Old Testament and see the same language. So, again, these passages, and down here, these are the ones in the Corinthians that talked about us being the temple, being indwelt by the very presence of God. That's what makes us holy ones. We are in Christ, and, and, and Christ is in us through the Spirit, and all these familiar New Testament concepts. But they are matched and mixed and you know, coupled with divine sonship and adoption language in the New Testament that is not accidental. God wants a family, so we have, he uses family terms. He has a divine family, a non-human divine family, the sons you know, of God. And, and so when that terminology is used in the New Testament, uh, you know, the, son, the non-human sons of God are also called holy ones. When, 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 both, when both of those terms and all that language is used in the New Testament of believers, there's a deliberate conceptual connection being made that is inherently Edenic. Because again, if you think back to Eden, it was God on earth with both his heavenly beings, because where God is, the council is. They're inseparable. And he creates humankind to image him. The image is a plural, because the other beings also are his imagers. They represent him in whatever realm they're, they're supposed to do, whatever, whatever tasks they have. Human beings are the same. So Right away, from the very beginning, from the, you have this sense of there's, there's this conceptual linkage between God's people and his council, his council holy ones, on earth with him. That gets disrupted, obviously, by the fall. And the rest of the story is trying to restore that. And when you get to the New Testament, you get the language again. You get the language repeated and often in an eschatological sense, but even this, not all these passages here and back here, not all those passages are speaking of end times, of the final culmination. This is already but not yet as well. Okay? It, 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 it's a reality that, that is, but its final form awaits. I think perhaps the best uh, example of this is Hebrews 1 and 2, and I'll, I'll just summarize this. If you go to Hebrews 1 and 2 with, with, with a council setting in mind, I think it's one of the most powerful passages in the New Testament. Because there is Jesus in the congregation, which is how the, most translations put it. It's, it's, the same, it's one of the same words you know, that, that's used in the Septuagint for the council. Okay, there he is in the council, and what's he doing? He's presenting us to them, and declaring us to be his brothers. I mean, it, it, it's just, it's so, pardon the expression, it's so pregnant with theology. <clears throat> you know, it, it, that it, it's, it's an explosive passage that, I mean, people can appreciate it without a divine council context, but if, if you have that going in, it, it's just a reorienting thing. <clears throat> as to what is going on in that scene. Because that's also the scene, well, which of the angels did God do this to? Which of the angels did God... You know, and, and it's not about the angels. It's about us. And Jesus was, was the key, was the point person. And here he is in the council presenting us to God and his council as his brothers. And if we're his brothers, then we have shared ruling authority in that body in that council with him and with the Father. It, it, there's just so much that, that's in there. 
I mean, you could, you could spend a couple hours just going through that. Yes. Is that why he had to become fully man? Yes, I think I think there's a there's a deliberate uh, connection there. Um, to he is he is the what, what's the word I'm looking for? He's the hinge point. He's 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 the point person. Uh, he is he's the matrix, the intersection, whatever of 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 both realms, both membership classes, both ruling class. I mean, everything converges in him. Which is one of the points. I don't. I don't think when he's called the Alpha and the Omega, it, it it refers just to like eternity. I think it's beginning and ending. I mean, he he is both the beginning and the end, and he's also the convergence point, the keystone, the keystone. I mean, all all the all these ideas, you know, that, that convey the well, here's another one, centrality, you know, of of Christ. Go ahead, Michael. I'm looking in um, Hebrews chapter one verse nine. It says, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. You're, I'm just trying to understand. Mm -hmm. You have God, therefore God, even thy God, which is a distinction of the, maybe the invisible Yahweh, but mm -hmm. there's something distinctly different about Jesus in that verse. And then who are his fellows? Because it sounds like he's being taken from among lesser beings, which he's not, and and being lifted up, but it yeah, wouldn't I don't, be I have to, to actually look. I'd have to actually look at the whole... Sure. Can we, can we hold we can that till Q&A? Yeah. yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, to, make, to make sure I'm, I'm in sync with you mentally, I'd have to look at that. Displacement, second theme, earthly rule for human council members. Here you get the same language. Him who overcomes. And in this case, if you look up these verses, we, we won't bother to do these. But if you look up these verses, it's about being set over the nations. It's about, you know what, I would like to look up 321, because I, I think that's the least, the less familiar. If somebody can look up Revelation 321, I think that's even clearer than being set over the nations. If somebody has it, go ahead. Revelation 3.21. Those who prove victorious, I will allow to share my throne, just as I was victorious myself and took my place with my father on his throne. I mean, that's really explicit. <laughs> I mean, believers get to share the throne. I mean, just think about that. It, it's it's very similar, but even more explicit than Daniel uh, seven. When uh, the the Son of Man passage, it, it doesn't it doesn't just end with the unveiling of the Son of Man, because the Son of Man receives everlasting dominion and kingship and all this stuff. But then, if you keep reading, even there, the kingship is shared with the holy ones and the people of the holy ones. You get you get both sides. You get both councils, as it were. Two, two parts of the same council structure, but it's it's shared dominion, and you have the same echo here. Now here, you know, he's speaking specifically to, to believers. Uh, this is the one where we get set over the nations. Well, who are, who are over the nations now? You know, who are the, you know, whose dominion are they? Well, it's, again, it's, it's the sons of God that are being displaced. They're being replaced with the sons of God who are in Christ, which are us. So again, it's this shifting and again, Psalm 82 has that judgment element in it, Daniel 7. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6 is one you're probably uh, aware of. This is Paul's little... Paul needs to address the fact that Christians are going to, you know, civil authorities against one another. They're taking each other to court, that sort of thing. And Paul says, you know, why are you doing this? Uh, you know, you, sh you should be taking care of this among yourselves. And then he, he says, sort of has this throwaway line. Don't you know that you will rule over angels? Mm -hmm. Okay, if you think of the council structure, Godhead, sons of God, and then down here are the angels. Okay, this is us. We're the middle tier. The ones who inherit the nations, you know, the rulership status. We are above 
you know, the angels. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's an oblique reference, again, to a hierarchical relationship and one that we're inserted into by virtue of the comment. So, it, it, again, it, it seems like sort of a throwaway statement. But, again, it points to joint uh, administration of, of things. And, and we, have a, we have a position you know, of, of r very real authority. And in the new heaven and new earth and all that stuff. So, moving along. Globalizing Eden. Now, the day of the Lord. This is a link. Again, I, I, that, that one was for me. I'm not going to go to to run the, generate the search in my software. Uh, basically, the, the phrase or closely related expressions occur mm -hmm. over 200 times, or nearly 200 times in the prophets. And you have phrases like, on that day, or that day, or in the latter days, something like that. And the day of the Lord has certain elements, judgment of the nations, judgment of God's people, but that isn't the eschatological view. What I mean here is, this phrase will be used in various passages that are not speaking of end times. They're speaking of some other event because the day of the Lord is, is, a, is a phrase that's associated with punishment of enemies or judgment. But when it, in the eschatological passages in the Old Testament, this element is not present. And why would that be? Well, because judgment for sin has already taken place. You know, the cross, again, the whole, the intersection of these ideas. So we have judgment of the nations and future deliverance in the eschatological passages. Paul refers to the day of the Lord, and the context indicates he's thinking of the coming of Jesus in these passages. So, again, th th this isn't an, an evidence for or against any particular view of eschatology. I just want you to, to realize that, that in Paul's mind, the day of the Lord, the final day of the Lord, is connected with the return of Christ. Now, if you don't believe in a rapture, you think, well, that's easy. You know, the Lord comes back, and then we have Armageddon. Well, you know, th those two things happen in conjunction with the other. That's right. But, you know, if, if you take the preacher position, this, this doesn't really contradict it either. It's just an easier fit in the one. Um, 2 Timothy 1.12 uses the term that day to designate a future time when Christians will be rewarded. So, I picked these two because they show both elements. There's judgment and there's reward. Again, it follows the typical pattern you would expect with Day of the Lord. Now, another part of the Day of the Lord is the eschatologization of chaos imagery. In other words, the use of chaos imagery in association with end times. And probably the best passage for that is Isaiah 27.1. In that day... The Lord, with his hard and great and strong sword, will punish Leviathan, the twisting serpent, Leviathan, the crooked serpent, and he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. Leviathan's final destruction will thus coincide with the eschatological restoration of Israel. If you read after verse 1, verses 2 and following, this is what you read about, the restoration of Israel. Now the question for us is, does that mean national Israel? Or does that mean, you know, the church? Well, if the day of the Lord is in conjunction with the return of Christ, it's probably best to take this as refer. this is just me talking, it's probably best to take that as referring to the establishment, the consummation of the kingdom. And that is circumcision neutral. That's global. It's not just the church. It's not national Israel. It's everything. So, again, I don't think you can use this for or against any particular view. But what I really want to highlight is this language again. This verse shows that Leviathan, chaos, was not dead in Genesis. He's dead here. He can't be dead if, it, if, if the Lord needs to, you know, slay him here. Okay? Uh, and again, it's, it's, not a, it's not an actual creature or critter. The idea is that in Genesis, even when God says it's very good, there's still that untamed thing going on. There's still that untamed element. In the future, that's gone. That's dealt with. Which is why, you know, we get these, these in the Old Testament, we get a foreshadowing of what the kingdom is going to be like. And of course, you know, these things right here, sick and disabled, we could add resurrection to that. This is the kind of stuff Jesus is doing when he's around the first time. He wants you to know what the, 
that the kingdom of God is here, <laughs> and this is what it's going to be like, but of course he knows that this is just the inauguration. This is the kickstart. But it's message, messaging as far as this is what, what the kingdom life is like. There's full health. There's no death. All this language, again, these are all passages in the prophets that the land will be supernaturally abundant. It's Eden. Okay, of course it'll be supernaturally abundant. That's what Eden was like. Peace throughout all creation, no conflict. And again, all nations will know that Yahweh is God. Again, the nations are repossessed. So again, the familiar themes. So in Revelation 21.1, it should be no surprise that when we get to the end of Revelation, we see that the sea was no more. And create, of course it's no more, because now creation is perfected. And we have the tree of life, again, Edenic imagery here. Zechariah 14 describes the dark side. And that, I'll make that a separate uh, topic. The final battle that, that precedes this. So the negative side, or not, not the negative, I look at it as a positive because evil gets what's coming to it. But the violent side is probably a better way to say it. The violent side of the, the day of the Lord concerns this final battle. Now I want to spend a, a little bit of time here because I, I'm going to lead to something that I, I did not share last year that I think is kind of cool in terms of an Armageddon Divine Council link. Zechariah 14 is a famous passage that anybody who studies prophecy has run into this one. I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. The city shall be taken, houses plundered, women raped, and all this kind of stuff. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on the day of battle. On that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives. And we just read that, that passage. So this is, again, a, a, a future, an eschatological conflict and battle that's described here. Zechariah 12, we have the siege of Jerusalem will also be against Judah. On that day I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it will surely hurt themselves, and all the nations of the earth will gather against it. Start seeing familiar patterns. See, Jerusalem under siege, the nations gathered against it. Okay, then the Lord intervenes, protect the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the nations that gather against Jerusalem are punished. Anybody who does eschatology is going to look at Zechariah 14, Zechariah 12, as describing you know, Armageddon, you know, some sort of final, final conflict, final battle. And same thing for Joel 3. Let the nations stir themselves up and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, which is, in this passage, not really defined. In, in fact, in, in no passage is it explicitly defined what this valley is. Uh, there I will sit to judge all the nations. Put in this sickle, the harvest is ripe. Okay. We get this language in Revelation, obviously. Uh, sources like Josephus and contemporary geographers tell us that the Jehoshaphat Valley was the Kidron Valley just east of Jerusalem. Now, I'm, I'm telling you this for a reason. Because we have some issues to think about. If we take all those passages together of a final battle at the day of Yahweh, we need to sort of consider them in light of Armageddon and Revelation 16. Is it going to be a coherent picture? And the above align alignment illustrates that Revelation cannot be understood in linear chronological terms. Okay, That part isn't clear to you but I'm going to show you something that at least revel, Revelation, at least in part, keep listen to my wording, I'm not endorsing that all of it is repeated cycles, but there are some places where it's, it's pretty hard to deny that's going on. And I'm going to show you two or three places in particular. And I'm going to compare these Old Testament passages we just looked at from Zechariah and Joel and we're going to look at Revelation 16 with Armageddon. And you're going to see that there's some cycling going on. And we'll talk about the term, too. Revelation 16. Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blesses the one who stays awake. So on and so forth. Familiar language. 
And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew, it's important, that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Seventh angel pull, poured out his bowl into the air, a loud voice comes out, and we have an earthquake and great hailstones in association with this Armageddon event. Revelation 19, we have armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white horses, you know, the one sitting on a white horse you know, comes back. Again, everybody says this is the second coming. I, I would certainly agree. So here's the battle. Here's the intervention right here, the Lord's return. And after the Lord's return, we get this. He called, I saw an angel standing in the sun, a loud voice. He called to the birds that fly directly overhead. Come gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings and captains and mighty men and the flesh of horses and their riders. Now the things that I have in blue here, earthquake, hailstones, calling the, the birds come and eat the corpses and all that stuff, those are three things I want to zero in on. Well, here we have them listed. This is again another search that I'm not going to bother to, to link out to. These three things are present in these three references. Does anybody know what these references are? What happens in Ezekiel 38 and 39? The destruction of Jerusalem. Be more specific. It's Gog and Magog. It's Gog and Magog. Now, this I will come down on. These three elements, that I, and I just showed you, they're all associated with the Armageddon passage. Jesus comes on the white horse to end that battle. Okay. There's no way Okay, if, if these three elements just so happen to be in here, drawn from here, and there's, there's more to it than this, but I'm stopping here for a reason. How in the world can you have Gog and Magog occur before the second coming, anywhere? A lot of your pre-trib systems have that. And there's a reason that they, they have it that will become apparent soon. Because they, 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 they really want to have this be a separate event from Armageddon. Because not doing so sort of mars certain points of the chronological system. I'll leave it at that. But know this observation. By the way, this, the birds eating the flesh, is really rare. Okay? That's really uh, not a common phrase. And so it's, it's really sort of a tell, a telltale sign that, you know, we're, we're creating a link between this and Revelation where this occurs. And it does not occur, you know, prior to a rapture or something like that. It, it just doesn't. I mean, even if you take a rapture in a seven-year tribulation, I know some systems that have Gog and Magog occurring before the rapture. I, 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 don't, I just I can't conceive of how you get there. That's independent of the rapture issue. I'm just I'm coming down on that one because I, this is one of the, the passages I think there's most incoherence about in most prophetic systems, most prophetic schemes. And it used to be because uh, Gog and Magog were, were somehow equated with Russia, okay, Prince of Roche, which is actually a, a mistranslation. It's chief prince. Roche is not Russia. Hebrew is not Russian. Just like English isn't Chinese, just because I make certain sounds with my mouth in English doesn't mean the same set of sounds in Chinese mean the same things. You laugh, but that, that's where people are at. That's where they're at. And, and that, that is just utterly bogus. I mean, I don't know any other way to, to characterize that. Now, what that means is that this event if it's tied to this, is connected in some way to Jerusalem, because all those other passages we, we just read, we had the final conflict at Jerusalem. And again, 
we have a reference here in Ezekiel 5.5 5 that refers metaphorically uh, to, uh, to the holy city, the you know, city of Zion and things like that. So here's the question. If we have these Armageddon descriptions and we have this connection over here and we have this connection to Jerusalem in here and in all those other passages, Shouldn't Armageddon happen at Jerusalem? You would think, where do people usually put Armageddon? Megiddo? Megiddo. Why would Revelation 16.16 16 point to Megiddo when all the rest of the final battle passages point to Jerusalem? I would say it doesn't. Okay. Revelation 16 to 16, 16 is not about Megiddo. Armageddon is not about Megiddo. That association is, is made because of the similar sound, the similar you know, terminology or the or parts of terms. The term Armageddon is actually a conflation, that is a combination of the earlier Jerusalem passages with this particular passage, Zechariah 12.10. Let's take a look at the term because this is going to this is going to produce something that that I think is really cool. Revelation sixteen sixteen. Here they are. John says they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Now, if you look at the Greek, remember yesterday I said this little mark here is the rough breathing mark. It's the h sound. So in Greek you would say this har mageddon. Har Megiddon. In Hebrew, Har means mountain. There are no mountains in Megiddo. Megiddo is everywhere else in the Old Testament described as a plain. If you've ever been there, you know that. It's just a wide, flat expanse. There is no mountain of Megiddo. Does it, doesn't it sit at the base of uh, the mount where, I can't remember, Carmel? The base of Mount Carmel. Carmel is to the to the northwest. You know, one one tip of what would be the wider, you know, the wider valley of Megiddo gets close to Carmel. And so you, you bring that up because that is the is the typical way that you get a mountain of Megiddo. That's cheating. Uh, because people somehow desperately want this at Megiddo. And, you know, I say desperately. That's a little bit of an overstatement. They, they feel compelled because they don't know better um, so that there's not a contradiction in the Bible. They have to have some justification for Megiddo being the location. Is it a staging point? No. I would say not only do the other passages point to Jerusalem, but again, Megiddo is not a mountain and has no mountain. I don't think the point is Megiddo at all. Again, here's references to the plain of Megiddo. Here's what I think is going on with the term. What, what John does many times is he'll... We had this yesterday when I had a little chart on Revelation about how John will take... Uh, different parts of passages, in, typically in Daniel. And then he'll combine them, you know, in one image. We saw, we, we, like with the beast, the beast in Revelation 13 actually has elements of the beast in both Daniel 2 and 7. Mm -hmm. And John merges them all together and, you know, makes a nice little ball of it. John does that elsewhere with prophetic passages mm -hmm. in other places. And this is one of them. Zechariah 12.11 is unique in that it's the only time Megiddo is spelled with an N at the end. It's Megiddon. And so the end element becomes important. It's, it's an archaic, odd spelling. It means that Jerusalem, because elsewhere in Zechariah, he's talking about Jerusalem. If, why don't we go, to go back to Zechariah 12? I'll show you what I mean here. I think I have it here. There we go. Oh, I cut it off at 10. Yeah, somebody go to Zechariah 12. 
Of course, I may have it here, too. Oh, here I have it. Sorry about that. I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and wept bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. On that day, the mourning in Jerusalem will be as great as the mourning for Hadad, Ramon, and the plain of Megiddo. This refers to a different event back in the Old Testament. Uh, Actually, actually, Hadad Ramon was a place notorious for child sacrifice. And so, as great as the morning was there, it'll be... When all this happens, in Jerusalem, people are going to be just as, as sad, just as you know, bitterly sad as people were when this sort of stuff happened in the plain of Megiddo in ancient times. I'm using the English translation here. What happens here is that Jerusalem is the point. Zechariah is, is being consistent with all the other passages. When the Lord comes back and they look on him whom they've pierced, he comes to Jerusalem. This is where he stops the battle. But what John does is John knows this, and he's going to cryptically both hide and tell you something about the event. He's going to take the last two letters of Megiddo, D, the D and the N, and he's going to add them to the word Har. Okay? And then we have to deal with the middle consonant. The other component of Megiddo, most assume that in Hebrew, these Greek letters are the Hebrew MGD, and so we get Megiddo. There's another option. This little squiggly here is also a Hebrew consonant that gets transliterated in Greek with a G, with a G. In Hebrew, you'd pronounce it like in the back of your throat. Best illustration is Gomorrah is actually spelled Gomorrah, not with the Hebrew G. But we don't have this. We have that. <laughs> okay. Greek didn't have this, but Greek had a G. So Greek actually uses a G for two different Hebrew letters. It's assumed when you get Magedon, oh, it must be the G. I'm going to suggest that it's this one, because this word is really important in divine counsel stuff. Har Magedon is actually Har Moed. And the O-N is taken from the Zechariah 12 reference to link uh, that with Jerusalem. What does Har Magedon mean? There is the literal translation. Mount of Assembly. And it comes from Isaiah 14. The Lucifer passage. How are you fallen from heaven? You know, Halal ben Shakar. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. Above the stars of God, I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly. I will sit on the Har Moed. The Har Moed. This is the place where the divine council meets. I am going to rule the council. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I might, will make myself like the most high. Far reaches of the north is Hebrew Yarkate Tzaphon. We've talked about Tzaphon before, the, both the geographical and the cosmic north. So I want to talk about these two phrases, Har Moed. Har Moed tells you that the Battle of Armageddon is going to take place at and for Jerusalem because that is where God lives. That is where the council is. That, that is the Mount of Assembly. And we have here the other phrase, the heights of the north, gets used in Psalm 48. Now, think about what you're reading, because it's not going to make any literal sense. Great is the Lord, greatly to be praised in the city of our God, his holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth, Mount Zion in the heights of the north, in the far north, in the Yarkate Tzaphon, the city of the great king. Is Jerusalem located in the north? Not even close. 
the language is cosmic. It has nothing to do with literal geography. Mount Zion was perceived as the cosmic dwelling place, meeting place, headquarters of God and his council. And so when John's telling you that the enemies are going to be gathered at a place called Har Magedon, he's talking about Jerusalem. But you only know that if you know what the Har Moed is. So it's a cryptic reference to Jer all the passages agree. There is it's not that like 20 of them say the battle's at Jerusalem and then you get to Revelation and it changes to Megiddo. It doesn't. They're all in agreement. <clears throat> this is a battle for the holy city, for Mount Zion. That's what Armageddon is. Both in terms of, you know, people, you know, human conflict, warfare, and, you know, you, you, get, you get a sense that this is, this is a war between gods and men. I mean, this, this is like for all the marbles in both the earthly plane and the non-earthly plane. There's that much significance attached to this event. This is the final battle. So implications would be, you go back, we have these elements here. They match in Ezekiel. We have them here in the New Testament. And guess where else you have them? You have a reference to Gog and Magog in Revelation 20. You know why this is weird? Because it's after the thousand years. Well, no, wait a minute. I thought Armageddon is before the thousand years. It is. This is usually this correlation, Gog and Magog, because Gog and Magog stuff happened three chapters earlier, and here it's happening after. This is taken by most scholars as showing that Revelation cannot here be read chronologically. It's this repetitive idea. But I know people who hold so tenaciously to the thousand year uh, idea. And again, I don't, I don't deny a, a, an unearthly kingdom. I, I think you know that by now. But I... They hold so tenaciously to a linear reading of Revelation and a thousand year kingdom, strictly a thousand years, that they just they just literally arbitrarily say this must be a different Gog and Magog other than the one in the Old Testament. That is really forced. That is that is a cart before the horse approach. That's saying, I want my system so badly, I'm just going to say it can't mean what it meant in the you know, it, it can't refer to what it is in the Old Testament. It has to be something entirely new to save the system. I actually had a student email me one time about this and ask me if there was a, a disagreement in manuscripts. You know, is there something wrong with the text here? And, and I, my answer was, no. Instead of asking yourself, is there something wrong with the New Testament, you ought to be asking yourself, is there something wrong with my system? Okay, but a lot of people don't. Again, language repeated before and after. And so the only way to really get that is this idea, at least here. So I've put these in red because this is where that those, those terms show up, right here. And they show up here again, and they show up here again. So it's a cyclical thing, at least with respect to this much stuff. Foe from the north. Let's stop there and get the question. He says battle takes place in Jerusalem, by the Temple Mount. Mm -hmm. But you know, Moses was given the plan for the temple, and you'll see that I'll make it according to the plan I showed you in the mount. A heavenly temple, an earthly temple, the new Jerusalem coming down, an earthly Jerusalem, a heavenly Jerusalem. So I mean, but this is going to be on earth. It, 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 it's, on, it's on earth, but it has ramifications for both control of the unseen world and domination of the earth. It, 
it, it's the heavyweight title match. Okay, who gets to be called king, and who you know, who is the king? Who rules the earth and the and the unseen realms, and who doesn't? You know, it is in every sense the final the final battle, the final conflict. And these beings have been here, <coughs> I think, and they're coming back. Yeah, and so and so are gods, because Zechariah 14 talks about the Lord bringing His holy ones with Him to this battle. This is why at, at, at Qumran, uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's a famous Dead Sea Scroll called, appropriately enough, the War Scroll. <laughs> and it, it, it spells out, there the writers, you know, living in the 2nd or 1st century B.C., their conception of the final battle. And they literally have a war, literally, between gods and men, where they're like both on planet duking it out over Jerusalem. You know, that, that's the prize. So it, it, was, it was very much, you know, in their consciousness. And they, there are other passages that, that associate the divine council and a call for war um, for Jerusalem. How would they come up with these concepts? I think what they're trying to communicate is that there's a seen world and an unseen world. They're both real, and they are both at stake. And this is this is the best way to do it. But I mean, what other language would you use? You know, I I, I couldn't conceive of another way to describe uh, conflict for for a people. You know. We have different metaphors for different things based upon our, our modern conception. We could call things a contagion or a cancer or something. You know, that's not going to work with them because they don't know what those things are. They do know what battles are. They do know what warfare is. They know what killing and life and death are. I mean, they, they know those things. And so warfare imagery, you know, like we talked about a couple of days ago, the putting your foot on the neck of the enemy and you know, the dogs lapping up the blood, because they'd seen those things. That's, those are the la that's the language of experience, of appearance. And so it's going to get used with respect to both realms, because that is what communicates the idea. You know, to use something that, that's foreign, you know, it's, for, it's, it's not going to occur to the author anyway. It's, you're not going to be able, I mean, think about it. I'm going to sit down and write a letter using using unfamiliar metaphors to both me and the per I mean, That's just incoherent. You're going to use what, what you know and what the recipient knows. Another thing, <clears throat> in the Old Testament, there's, there's what scholars call a recurring theme or motif. And I've mentioned this before, that <clears throat> everything bad just seems to come from the north. <laughs> And there was a reason why militarily this happened because of the Fertile Crescent and all that stuff. And it, it sort of created this, this twitchy psychology that, you know, if, you're, if trouble's going to come, it's just going to come from up there because it sort of always does, you know, that kind of thing. And we saw that the north, there's both literal geography and then there's this, this cosmic north as well. Revelation will also often portray the final enemy as Babylon. And that makes sense to the ancient reader because Babylon took them into exile and Babylon came from the north. So when you get to Ezekiel, Gog and Magog, guess where they come from? The far par portions of the north. You know, where does Antiochus come from? <clears throat> the north, because that's where... You know, the Seleucid Empire was located. Uh, again, this, this idea gets repeated over and over and over. And we talked about Bashan and, again, the Cosmic North. <laughs> so, <clears throat> again, you know, here you have, of course, the map. And you've got Babylon over here. But they have to, they have to travel. You know, to get down here, you have to descend from the north. Now, this works itself out in some unusual ways. And here you have descriptions of Babylon as being northern. And even though we know <clears> that it's not, and it's because of the travel route. Gog and Magog, again, from the north. There they are up there. So that's, that's normal. That's natural. But this gets abstracted 
in a way that that some Jews and and early Christians, the way they conceived of Antichrist, this tradition led some to suspect that the great eschatological enemy. If, and if you're a Jew, you're not going to use the word Antichrist. You're going to you're going to be thinking the enemy we have to face at the day of the Lord is going to come from the north. So <clears throat> they associated this with Bashan and Dan because this was, again, the center of apostasy. And the reason they did that are certain passages like this. I just want to show you where, the, where this Dan Antichrist psychology comes from and, and how it, it gets argued. <clears throat> I think it's interesting. I I'm not committed to it, but I, I, I do think there, there's something worth thinking about here. <clears throat> you know, I, I would say I haven't adopted this yet, but I'm still, I'm still thinking about it. Dan shall be a serpent in the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that his rider falls backward. Um, this is Jacob's blessing of his children, and then we get something that doesn't quite sound like a blessing. And it associates Dan, again, with serpentine language. Deuteronomy 30 through 22. Of Dan, he said, Dan is a lion's cub that leaps from Bashan. You know, Bashan is a loaded term. And the association in some sense is natural because Dan is like at Bashan, geographically. So you could restrict it to geography, or you could ask yourself, well, you know, is should we attach some cosmic sinister meaning to this, and then, of course, to Dan? Now, the really odd thing that a lot of early Christian writers noticed is Revelation 7. You, you know where this is going. 144,000. Go ahead and turn to Revelation 7. I don't think I printed it out. You have your Bible, flip over to Revelation 7. And the, the part that we all know is there's 144,000, and the text says 12,000 from each tribe. each tribe. Okay, go ahead and look at the passage. Read through it, eight verses. Tell me if you notice something. <laughs> Leave it to Irenaeus to, to notice something like this. What do you notice? Dan is not listed. There are still 12 tribes, but Dan is not one of them. That means nobody, or does it, I shouldn't say that means. Does that mean that Dan is not a believing tribe? Dan is not elect? There are no, there are no believers from Dan. In other words, does that create a really creepy, sinister feeling about Dan? Well, for some early Christians it did. Because they noticed that, and then they went back to these Old Testament passages, and it's like, the shaman, <coughs> serpent, what happened to Dan in Revelation 7? Like, why is Dan excluded? Uh, now, we don't get a listing of the tribes for the gates of, this, of the, the new city, the new Jerusalem. So we can't explicitly say that Dan is, an excluded, is excluded there. But if you take the reference to the 12 tribes there as the same 12 tribes here, Dan is also not part of the holy city. It's just kind of weird. Now, if you take this northern model at face value, and we could throw in Dan here if you want. Again, I, I'm just I'm just showing you that that this is there. You could you could put down here tribe of Dan. <laughs> okay. Um, but the problem is, though, that Antiochus was a Gentile. Uh, I'll say this. There are some, and again, I don't say this because I think it creates a difficulty. 
it's not an insurmountable difficulty for inerrancy, but it creates a difficulty. Some scholars believe that Dan was not an original tribe. And that's because the, there are certain things about Danite. When, first, first of all, the Danites give up their inheritance and they migrate north. There are also certain issues with place names associated with Danite places and cities that are not Semitic. Now, in and of itself, that doesn't mean much because lots of people, you know, lived in, in Canaan. But there, some people wonder if, if the Danites are not related to and perhaps the same as the Danunians, who were one of the sea peoples of which the Philistines were one. And then if you do that, then you got a, the association of the Philistines with guess who? The Rephaim. And so some people think that that's another strand, another reason to exclude Dan. That there's just something wrong with Dan. Uh, they're, they're a bad presence that is essentially an infiltration. It's also the Danites that are mixed up in the last three chapters of Judges, which are pretty horrific. Um, there are other reasons for that, though. I, again, I, I'm not coming down here any, anywhere. This I would put under the area of speculation. I'm just telling you this gets discussed in the literature. Back to the Antiochus model, this gets discussed too, and it's probably more familiar and digestible. Antiochus does or is these things. So there are some that would say Antiochus is sort of the poster boy, the template for, for characteristics of the Antichrist. The one that throws a lot of people is he was a Gentile, because there are a lot of people out there, the Antichrist must be a Jew because he needs to be a, 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 like a flip version of Jesus. Well, we have four minutes to talk okay. about it. You can just be a, a pseudo-Messiah as well. It doesn't really attach any ethnicity to it. Antichrist and Nephilim Rephaim. I, I'm actually going to stop here. If we want to do this in Q&A, we, we can. Because, again, this is another one of those things I'll file under. I just want to show you this because it gets discussed. And that is the gematria of 666. We will do that. Okay, so let's stop here. It's a good place to stop then. Okay. And we can come back and hit that. That won't take too long. Again, I'm not taking a position here. I'm not saying, hey, like, do gematria to your heart's content. Uh, I'm just bringing it up because in this instance, 666, it's very likely that we do have gematria because John tells us, here's a number you have to figure out its meaning. It's the number of a man. Okay, The mystery isn't the number because he gives you that. The mystery is, what does it stand for? What does it mean? Now, gematria is like a subset of numerology. Gematria was very common in uh, Jewish and Christian circles and other circles, but especially Jewish and Christian because... Not all languages do this. A lot of languages will have uh, symbols for certain numbers, you know, units of numbering, either the ones and the tens and the hundreds and the thousands and whatever. Hebrew and Greek do not have, as a normal course of things, a set of signs for numbers. They, they have certain, they have consonants do double duty. So in the case of Hebrew, your first nine consonants are numbers 1 through 9. So if I'm a scribe and I'm writing along and I want to say how old somebody is, uh, <clears throat> I can either write out the number longhand, like we would do a 388, you know, use, use the, whole, the whole words. But if I wanted to, to just represent the number, I would pick certain consonants. <clears throat> the one, one that stood for 300, one that stood for 10, one that stood for 8, you know, that kind of thing. So that lends itself to numbers having meanings because when you have a number 
and you convert it to its consonants, in a lot of cases you have a meaning, or what's often done is whatever the consonants are, that'll become a word, like a, a proper name or something. It just becomes its own word. And then, it, and then that word, <coughs> that new word put into the language will stand for that number. People will just memorize it that way. So in this case, there are scholars who, who uh, consider that 666 might have a gematric meaning, a gematric uh, referent. So with that preface, we have here 666. Now this number in both Jewish and again Christian circles was considered inferior to God because it, John said it was human and also because the addition of the number, <clears throat> again, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to limit this to the, to the Greek stuff primarily for uh, because Revelation is written in Greek. This number 666 was less than the name Jesus, which would be Jesus. When you, when you plug the numbers in for that, that equaled 888. And so that's why Jesus is known in certain texts as the fullness of the Ogdod. The Ogdod is a word for eight, and he's the fullness of eights, because his number means 888. You know, so the, some of these titles for for Jesus and other biblical characters that have these weird, like, what in the world are they talking about? Well, in a lot of cases they're talking about the number that their name turns into. It's like a shorthand. <clears throat> so 666 was less than Jesus, so it's inferior to Christ, and also because it's a number of a man, and Christ is the God-man, so that puts him above. And So the beast could be viewed you know, certainly as a man and also as a pseudo-Christ because there is a, there's a relationship between the three sixes and the three eights that I'll show you in a moment. Um, and so somehow <clears throat> the two identities, the two names are linked, one being superior to the other. We're not going to do anything with Jesus Christos, uh, not much anyway. You take those two words and put them into their, their numbers, and that number is 1480. Now, it just so happens, before I put that up, that in Jewish and Greek esoteric tradition and numerology, they believe that each, each celestial body, and they would use the word planets, and they would include the sun and the planets because, again, they had a geocentric view of the universe. So the sun was just another one of these things that orbit, you know, around the earth. They believe that each one possessed a spirit and an intelligence or was guided by a spirit and an intelligence. This goes back to the to the really old belief that <clears throat> celestial bodies were were living beings because they moved. And so that this, this is why you get uh, an overlap of divine being terminology, Elohim, with terms like Chokavim, the stars, heavenly hosts, that kind of thing. Uh, there was this presumed relationship. The name of this, of this you know, spirit or intelligence was derived from the numbers of that celestial body's magic square. Now what the magic square was, was you took the first 36 numbers and you arrange them in rows so that it's kind of like Sudoku. By, by virtue of, <coughs> of the arrangement, each row, horizontally, vertically, and diagonally, all added up to the same number. And once you were able to figure that out, that became known as the magic square, because it, it, it like works in every direction. And so each body had its own sort of magic square. And in this case, <coughs> 666 reflects the magic square of the sun because every row, this way, this way, this way, and this way, adds up to 111, and there are six of them. So you do the math, 666. Now, if we take 111 and take each one of these, 111 the sum, and put that into Hebrew, that produces the name Nakiel. That becomes sort of the code name for the number 111. Looks like that. <clears throat> I 
I've excerpted a little bit from this book, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Ancient Cosmology and Early Christian Symbolism. I do not recommend this book for baby no. Christians. Fidelaire is a Gnostic. Okay? He's a, Gnostic, he's a scholar, he has a PhD, he, he's, he's in, in some other, I can't remember what field it is, but <clears throat> he's a Gnostic. And so, it would be very easy to dive into this book and come out thinking all sorts of weird kinds of thoughts. Okay, but nevertheless, he has a really good handle on early Christian symbolism, because that's kind of what Gnostics do. And I want, to, want you to notice some of the commentary. Number 666, again, the magic square of the sun, and he talks about the grid here. The value of the entire square is therefore 666. And he talks about Nakiel. There's a thing called that the intelligence of the sun is Nakiel. The spirit of the sun is Sorath. Okay, it has a different spelling. So you get these two names that are associated with the sun. 888, of course, Jesus was the S-O-N and the S-S-U-N of early Christians. Uh, in, in fact, in, in early Christian, in any sort of astro-theological stuff, because Yahweh in the Old Testament is referred to as, as the sun, you know, those sun and shield passages. Um, and, that, and that would be because it's, it's the biggest, brightest celestial body. And if we assume all the celestial bodies are actually, you know, like living entities or, or powered by them, his is the biggest. Again, it's just very simple logic, simple analogy. And so Jesus replaces that for the early church because he is the God-man. Let's go over here. <clears throat> Again, 888, the plenitude of the Ogdodes and that sort of thing. Now, he gets into here about the Stoicheia, which naturally relates to this. But I want to focus on, let's see here. The name Jesus, 888, is a perfect name encompassing the whole of creation and is reflected in the perfection of the 24 letters of the classical Greek alphabet, which numerically contains eight letters denoting hundreds, eight denoting tens, eight denoting the ones, the units. And so to the Greeks, that 888 was special for that reason. Jesus is therefore alpha and omega, because it's the first letter of the Greek alphabet and the last. And the fact that you can divide the 24 letters into three precise units of eight 888 again, Alpha, Omega, 888. If you actually take Alpha and Omega, though, that number is num uh, 801. And this is, I mentioned this yesterday about the Dove, Peristera. If you plug in the numbers here, it's 801. So a lot of people think that's why we have the Dove image in the baptism passage. And then there's also the Noah, the, the Nuach rest connection. But it's another way of saying this is the Alpha and Omega. One more thing here, I think one or two more <coughs> slides, yeah, two more. So this is the magic square of the sun. If we take the numbers, this diagonal and this diagonal, which is the sign of what? This is the letter chi, the first word in Christos, which became a cross symbol. Okay, if you add these, you get two rows of 111, and that's 222, added to 666, equal 888. And so this became symbology for the superiority of Christ over whoever bears the number of the beast. And again, it's just a way to cryptically telegraph where you're at theologically. Jesus is the superior number. This other number is inferior. He's a, he's a pseudo-Christ. Now, all this <clears throat> goes in interesting places. I threw this in because some of you might, you know, symbols might be important, depending on, again, what, what you're doing, what you're working with. But there are a whole bunch of these, and I want to show you this one. Nakiel, again, is this 111. And so, again, in, in, in terms of Hebrew gematria, here are your numerical values for the name. And it just so happens 
that if you take the zeros off, you know, at least to the 50, you have the 5, and there's the 10, the 20, the 3, and the 1. People who did gematria <coughs> would play with the square like this, and then when they had a configuration of numbers that made sense to them in a reconstruction, they would connect them with lines, and then the symbol be all, became the code for the number and the code for the name. So th there are just there are just hundreds of these, you know, because that's what they, they're doing. So you might come across a symbol. I don't I don't have a, a big collection of these, but Fiddler's book has has several of them, but it's not hard to find, you know, sort of a, an assembly of these. So if you're coming across symbols. I, I might be able to find something interesting for you. What's the connection? <clears throat> what Greco-Roman deity was associated with the sun as the ruler of other deities? That would be Zeus. What was Zeus's parentage? What was he? Oh, come on, give me a cursor here. Zeus was one of the Titans. And I've colorized some things in DDD for you. I'll just go through this. In a strict sense, Titans is the collective name of only six of the sons of the original great, greater gods. Sky, heaven and earth, okay, Uranus and Gaia, whose six sisters and wives were also called Titanesses. Most important couple was Kronos and Rhea, who became parents of Zeus. The Greek name Titans occurs in the geographical name Valley of the Titans in the Septuagint. If you look this up in the Hebrew Bible or your English translation, can you guess what it's called? It's not the Valley of the Titans, because Titan is Greek. It's the Valley of the Rephaim. So again, now you have a conceptual link between the Rephaim, the Titans, Zeus, back to 666. This is what Irenaeus was tracking on. Uh, when, when Irenaeus, um, I, I have a, just a little bit of this, a word play on Titanos in the facade as part of the story. But there's actually more to it uh, than just the name. You know, Irenaeus in his book uh, Against Heresies discusses 666 and the different possible interpretations. And he doesn't necessarily endorse this, but he lets you know he kind of likes it. You know, to him, it, there's some coherence to it because the Titans were also tyrants, you know, and that's sort of the picture of the Antichrist in Revelation and whatnot. Let's go down here a little bit. I think I have one other, yeah. So, let's see here. Titan, again, in Greco-Roman thinking, and of course you have, if it's Greco-Roman, you have this connection to the Septuagint, which connects you to the Old Testament. Most of the children of Uranus and Gaia were of gigantic stature. Again, so Titans is still, in a wider sense, became more or less associated with giants and naturally the evil powers. The Titan, yeah, I always mess this up. Titanomachy, this is the, the, the battle, the wars of the giants that are described in, in Greek, you know, Greek mythology. And the gigantomachy uh, really you know, goes into this a little more. And so down here you have this reference to the valley of the Rephaim, the valley of, of the giants. And sometimes you'll actually have the word transliterated in the Septuagint or just as giant. And of course, this goes into stuff we know about the uh, sons of God and whatnot. And he says down here, the name is not found as such in the writings of the New Testament, but may be hidden in the 666 in the number of the beast, so on and so forth. Again, there's, there's the math equivalent. So I wanted you to see that so that you know it's not it's not just something, you know, off somebody's website. There are actually scholars who look at this and essentially say, it's kind of worth thinking about. I mean, this might be the point of the number. And so you say, well, what, what would the point be? Well, in some way, the number of the beast might 
be a clue or a telegraphing, uh, some sort of foreboding that whoever the Antichrist figure is, there is some connection between him and the Rephaim and or, again, Nephilim or something like that. There, there might be some association. Now, beyond that, you don't really know what the association is. Again, in Irenaeus' view, it referred to uh, at least being a tyrant, but it brings up the question of this sort of quasi-divine nature. And you could have someone come along and just claim to be a God-man and be able to do you know, amazing things, or you know, even, even more literally than that, you could have some sort of incarnation you know, that would be able to pull that off. Again, all of that is speculation, and it's all built off on the built off the assumption that 666 is gematria that works in that direction that I just showed you. I don't know that it does, and neither does anybody else, but it was something the church fathers considered, and it's something that scholars still um, write about, you know, and at least throw into the mix as far as an op 